And the chair sees a quorum and we'll call the meeting to order for the August meeting of the State Budget Committee. We thank you all and to the public for, for being here. And for those online, we're in wonderful Madison, Indiana, at the Ivy Tech campus. And so we welcome you also. I think we'll start today with introductions on my far left and staff included. So if you'll please, Liza, go ahead, please, and go around. Uh, Liza Sherman, uh, fiscal analyst, House Republican <coughs> Caucus. Representing Bob Cherry, House Republican. Fiscal analyst, Senate Republican Caucus. Susan Preble, Fiscal Analyst, Senate Democrat Caucus. Good morning, Fadi Kadura, State Senate, District 30, North Side of Indianapolis. Chris Ricci, Fiscal Analyst, Senate Republican Caucus. Senator Chris Garten, District 45, which would have been where we're at today until redistricting, uh, but I'm about 30 minutes from here, so I just want to thank Ivy Tech for hosting us and uh, look forward to a productive meeting today, so good morning. Uh, Jeff Thompson, House District 28, about oh, 25, 30 miles west of Indianapolis. Ben Tooley, Fiscal Analyst with the House Republican Caucus. Zach Jackson, State Budget Director. Joe Habig, Deputy Budget Director. Gregory Porter, House <laughs> District 96, Indianapolis. Eric Gonzalez, House Democrat, Fiscal Analyst. Ed Delaney, House District 86, North Side of Indianapolis. Lisa Ackelbert, Indiana State Budget Agency. Good morning, Randhir Jha with Legislative Services Agency. Thank you. Also like to thank Ivy Tech again for hosting us and for representing Snow I know is here, uh, Mayor Courtney, and I believe Chancellor Arson's here. Or, I'm sorry, she also was part of our host and I appreciate that. I know you have before us the minutes from the July, I'm sorry, it would be the June meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes as presented? Hearing none, I would accept the motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. A motion a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Next, I'd like to place on the table a proposed agenda. Are there any additions or corrections <coughs> to the proposed agenda? Mr. Chair, just a comment. Yes. Uh, had some conversation with Senator Mishler and it's sort of our understanding that in the past that there's been some level of an understanding with some of our higher ed institutions uh, that if one of our institutions wants to propose um, an increase higher than what CHE's proposed increases are um, that they would kind of come before this body um, of the budget committee and have that conversation um, and I would just ask uh, for consideration in the future that if our, there are institutions out there in that boat that they would they would do that before this body so thank you. Thank you. And it's my understanding, I believe, that would be looked at in the next meeting, going to be discussed. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on the proposed agenda? Hearing none, then, we place the proposed agenda on the table for discussion. And I believe we have first, then, uh, Indiana Department of Administration, Matt Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, Matt Kent, Department of Administration. The first project I have today is a request from the Department of Administration on behalf of the Indiana School for the Blind and Visually Impaired and the Indiana School for the Deaf, um, requesting the third and final appropriation to continue the work of co-locating the two schools on the current campus of the Indiana School for the Blind uh, in northern Indi Indianapolis. Um, as with IDOS past requests, these funds will go towards several different facets of the project and I'll give you just a little bit of details on each of those and if there's any questions we can go over those. Initially this work will go towards, or these dollars will go towards site work. This will include prepping areas for future buildings and interior roads that will be used on the campus for construction purposes and then also once the construction is done, there will be roads to, to move about campus. Also this will include laying the groundwork for future utilities and upgrades to the current utilities to prepare the campus for the co-location. The next area of expenses will be in rehabilitation as we completely renovate several buildings on the campus uh, that are current, the current buildings that are part of the future plan. Uh, this will include the historic administration building and then classroom buildings E, F, and G. These four buildings will be completely gutted and rehabbed to current standards uh, in line with the future use of the campus. 
These buildings, once completed, will serve as the business and administration offices and then also educational classrooms. Finally, these funds will go towards new construction. This will include a central utility plant, a wellness center, which will include a, a dining and health center, education buildings, dorms, sport fields, and associated buildings, and then also a parking garage to accommodate staff and visitors. Uh, we're currently on schedule to break ground in the summer of 2024 with this project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kent, for being here. Uh, I have a couple questions. You said this is the last installment of the three uh, installments uh, for, for this budget? Correct, sir. And what was the total uh, allocation for this? A uh, total of $655 million. $655 million. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you will. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know, I've been very uh, critical and uh, very sensitive to this combining of these two institutions with two different cultures uh, here, you know, within the state of Indiana, and um, that's the representatives and senators from that district, particularly with visually uh, uh, impaired and uh, deaf school, were not included in this whole process. Uh, so we're very concerned about, you know, the continued co-mingling of two different cultures uh, on, on, on the campus and how would that work. Also, I've asked on numerous occasions about XBE participation. Uh, you, you've, you've gotten this a third installment, $600 million, still haven't seen anything uh, from, from you or your administration from my perspective. Uh, I don't recall getting anything. I've asked for it on numerous occasions. So. Um, I'm very concerned about that. So, um, and last but not least, um, are you sure this is going to be the last that we spend uh, on, 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 this, uh, on this effort that was uh, kind of force-fed to people in the state of Indiana? I'll start with your last question and work my way backwards. Um, we anticipate this being the last amount. I can't say definitively because this is a, this is a project that's going to be probably four or five years of construction. Um, we've seen so far, the, the estimates we're getting back have been better than what we, we thought. Um, so we're cautiously optimistic that the $655 million is the budget that we're going to be working with. And we've worked with our contractors to let them know that number is the number that we're working towards. So when we do that, we take every avenue we can to value engineer everything to get to that 655. So that's the number that we're working with, and that's the number that we require them to work with as well. So. I can't, I can't sit here and say 100% that it will be the last dollar amount, but that's, the, that's our goal for that 655. Thank that, you. Okay. Um, the XBE. So on that, we, none, none of these dollars have been put out to bid yet for this project. So when we, when we put this out to RFP to get the contractors on, or the, we get a, a main contractor on board to basically manage the whole thing. They've, we've made well aware to them what our goals are for XBE on this project and then as a state as a whole. And so they're, they're working with our, our supplier diversity division to make sure that those goals are met. So as those numbers start coming in, as we start getting bids, I'll make sure to inform you and the committee of what those numbers look like. Can I follow up on that? So yep. this is the third and final quote unquote uh, installment. So what, are we just banking the money somewhere and not utilizing it or, so what, or what? For a project of this size, what we have to do is when we get the contractor on board, we're going with, it's, it's called the CMC, and so they give us a guarantee. Construction manager, I understand. Yep, so they give us a guarantee maximum price. But to put them under contract for that price, we have to have the dollars in our fund to do that. So to enter the requisition, to start the whole process, we have to show the contractor that we have the funds actually sitting in an IDUA fund. To put out there for them. Who's the, who's the contractor? Who's the construction manager on that? Um, Please, thank you. I can get that to you. I, I, I forget offhand. We've got so many projects right now. This is a $600 million project. I'm pretty sure you should know. I can get it for you here within half hour. Further questions? Yes, sir. Representative Delaney? Two simple questions. Uh, First, can you remind me of the geographical location of the new combined campus? It'll be on the campus of the current school for the, the blind. Okay. And the parents will want to know this. Uh, when might the parents expect that their children will be moving to the new facilities? When, when they'll open for actual use? We're hoping 2029, but it possibly could be 2030. So five to six years? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Further questions? Go ahead, please, sir. Okay. The next project I've got is a request for the White River State Park Development Commission. This is to begin repair and restoration of the historic pump house located on the White River State Park campus. This building originally served as the pumping station for the Indianapolis Water Company between 1870 and 1969, but most recently this building has been used for office space by the White River State Park staff and is currently used by Live Nation um, as well as other sports staff on the days leading up to events and concerts in the park. The majority of the work for this funding request will go towards replacing and repairing a facade of the brickwork, installation of new gutter systems, waterproofing exterior walls, installing new airtight windows, and then limited roof repairs where needed. Once the exterior work is done, we'll do a little bit of work on the inside, including replacement of several support beams and plaster replacement that was damaged due to water infiltration. Any questions? Thank you. Go ahead, Thank please. You. Okay, next on the agenda, I believe we have the Indiana Finance Authority. Jim McGough, please. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jim McGough, I'm with the Indiana Finance Authority. And um, today we're here to request a $20 million um, appropriation to accompany the roughly $33 million that Hamilton County is putting into a project to water and sewer an area that is near 236th Street and US 31 all the way up to um, uh, 276th Street and US 31. And the use of these funds, uh, the primary purpose is to provide the uh, required utility um, connections for the new um, uh, readiness center to be uh, installed in at 276 and US 31. Colonel Eakin with the Adjunct General's Office is here to discuss the project and I'm happy to discuss the financing piece if there's any questions. Any questions, members of committee? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colonel Kathy Eakin representing uh, Gen Major General Dale Lyles in the Indiana National Guard and uh, the Adjutant General's Office. So uh, piggybacking off of that, the Indiana National Guard requests the transfer of those funds in the amount of $20 million uh, in the, for the Hamilton County Writing a Center Phase Two, as you said, with regards to the water and sewer infrastructure project for the Hamilton County Writing a Center. Um, Hamilton County uh, in Indiana is creating a regional utility district to provide water and sewer service to the US 31 corridor in northern Hamilton County. The $20 million appropriation will be combined with the Hamilton County funds to complete phase two of this planned project. Pending any, your questions. Any questions? Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Moving on to number four, the Adjutant General's Office requests $5.6 million for Hamilton County Readiness Center for the purpose of purchasing furnitures, fixtures, and equipment, the new facility is planned to be completed and operational in fiscal year 25. The facility replaced operations for Kokomo, for Marion, and Elwood, combining those three armories and the units therein, uh, where uh, they're no, those armories are no longer to meet the demands of the units stationed there and will co all close upon completion of this project. Due to an agreement between Indiana and the federal government, the costs for this project are shared between both parties at 67% state and 33% federal. Pending your questions. Any questions? Thank you. Go ahead, please. The Adjutant General's Office requests $476,000 for the renovation of the Lafayette Armory Medical Readiness Area. This project will renovate an existing 5,000 square feet of uh, area on the second floor in the Lafayette Armory into a medical examination area to include the conversion of five offices into physical exam rooms, um, electrical and mechanical and plumbing upgrades to support the uh, medical equipment and the installation of medical sinks and upgrades, uh, excuse me, and updates the current communication infrastructure to support the uh, new medical equipment. Uh, this will allow the Indiana National Guard to expand our medical readiness capabilities and allow a higher throughput supporting soldiers deploying for state active duty and federal missions. This project would be a 50-50 cost split between the federal and the state governments. Pending your questions. Thank you. Questions? 
Thank you. Go ahead, please. We request uh, $12 million to modernize the Columbus Readiness Center. This project will include an addition of approximately 19,000 square feet and renovate the existing 20,000 square feet um, of the Readiness Center that's currently there. Uh, the current facility is 43 years old and is definitely in poor condition. Once complete, this facility will continue to house the 1st of the 151st Infantry Battalion, currently located there in addition to transferring the 338th Quartermaster Unit, which is a rigor unit, from a separately leased hangar just down the street right off of the Columbus Airfield. The rigor hangar um, that, is, that we're currently leasing um, costs the Indiana National Guard over $163,000 per year and has, has cost that and then some, um, depending on the lease contract, since 2016. It also does not have the required security nor the humidity control capabilities to support the rigor equipment appropriately, which in turn then costs more money to maintain that uh, equipment, that Army equipment. The current facility also lacks the appropriate training space for parachute rigging, uh, administration, supplies, arms vault, kitchen equipment, um, and military parking space. This project would be a 50-50 cost share between the state and federal governments. Penny, your questions? Questions? Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. The Adjutant General's Office requests $8.4 million for modernization of the Bloomington Readiness Center. The project includes an addition of approximately 6,200 square feet and the renovation of an existing 20,475 square feet of the Bloomington National Guard Readiness Center. The facility is over 63 years old and in poor condition. It lacks appropriate training areas um, and the space to conduct uh, training for that unit. The renovations will create sufficient space and uh, will allow the two of the 150 field artillery unit the appropriate space to train for their military assigned uh, mission. This project will be cost shared at 59% federal and 41% state. Pending your questions. Questions? Thank you. Continue, okay. please. The AGO's office requests funding for exterior masonry repairs for the Muscatatuck steam plant and powerhouse which was built 83 years ago. This facility still has the original masonry and due to natural weathering, uh, moisture infiltration has occurred and uh, deterioration of the mortar joints on the 24-foot um, exterior walls has occurred as well. This project will include preparation of the existing mortar, replacement of the dislodged bricks, and tuck pointing as required. This would be funded by the state at 100 percent. Pending your questions. Questions? Thank you. Continue, please. The AGO's office requests funding in the amount of um, $1.7 million um, for the transformation of the latrines at Terre Haute Armory. The current 26,000 plus square foot armory was constructed 43 years ago and, with, and it had limited uh, female latrine space. This facility houses now the 519th Combat, Support, uh, Combat Service Support Battalion, which, like many units now, has a higher percentage of females in their units as uh, what they did 43 years ago. This project would be a 50-50 cost share between the state and federal funds. Pending any questions? Questions? Thank you. Continue, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the AGO's office uh, finally requests the release of an additional funding, an amount of $8 million for the Martinsville addition and alteration project due to higher than expected bids. The project was previously reviewed by the Budget Committee in October 2022, and this facility supports individual and collective training, administrative functions, and logistical requirements for Bravo Company, 1st of the 151st Infantry Battalion. This facility is currently 65 years old and is in poor condition and lacks the appropriate training, storage, and parking space. Renovations will create sufficient space for the unit to train and operate in accordance with their doctrine and with their um, structure and their assigned mission. Due to, agreement, due to an agreement between Indiana and the federal government, the cost of the project would be shared between both parties. And pending your questions, that's all I have for today. Questions? Thank you for the Thank presentation. You. Next, I believe we have on the agenda Department of Corrections. Floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Kevin Orm. I'm Executive Director of the Construction Services Division of the Indiana Department of Correction. The first, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Correction, Christina Regal, who's here with me today. Uh, the first of our projects is the uh, tunnel repairs at Putnamville Correctional Facility for $7.5 million. Uh, the Putnamville Correctional Facility, a series of underground 
Um, maintenance tunnels distribute thermal and electrical energy throughout the facility as well as communications. I approached this committee in December of 19 following an unexpected collapse of one of those tunnels. You folks awarded me, um, 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 authorized me to spend money to effect those emergency repairs, which were done. We stood back, looked at the condition of the entire tunnel system that was installed in the 1980s and adopted a, a <coughs> mechanism of repair using carbon fiber, something we've never done in Indiana before. Um, in October of 2022, you approved a test section of that tunnel to try out the technology with a, a number of other state agencies looking at how we were doing it to possibly use that same mechanism of repair. We found it to be, we've completed those, uh, that test section, we have, have through all the engineering reports and testing, have found it to be fully um, 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 capable of supporting the, the lifetime of that and are requesting funding to continue and repair the entire system. I'll answer any questions. Any questions regarding Putnamville? Thank you. Continue, please. My next project is agency-wide technology upgrades. Just as in your, in your residences, uh, these prisons require massive amounts of uh, of technological data transmission to do our jobs in this in 2023. We haven't upgraded our the infrastructure, our technology infrastructure of our facility in the last 10, 15 years to use modern, uh, the modern programming, the modern electronics that we use to do our jobs. Um, we're, requ we're requiring, we're requesting $5.2 million to initiate the first of a series of two projects. The second will come in, in FY25 to conduct the upgrades of the technology infrastructure at seven facilities. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions regarding technology upgrades? <clears throat> Thank you, continue please. The third project for your consideration is $1.3 million for the powerhouse modernization of the uh, um, steam generation plant at the Heritage Trails Correctional Facility located in Plainfield, Hendricks County. It's a 1960s, uh, 1960s steam generation plant that's in immaculate condition. Um, the electronics that control the, the, the world is no longer controlled by, uh, for the most part, by valves and uh, valve efficiently by valves and, uh, and manual devices, electronic, the electronic uh, monitoring devices that we use on those electronic controls promote an incredible amount of efficiency. Um, the uh, powerhouse is just ready for an efficiency upgrade. It's at that point in its lifetime. Um, this will, project will more than, pay, pay, more than pay for itself over the lifetime just by saved energy. Any questions? Thank you. Continue, please. Thank you, sir. The uh, uh, next project is $4.2 million for the, and I, I keep talking about powerhouses I, today. I, could, I, I apologize for sounding like a broken record. Uh, the, the next project is at the Pendleton Correctional Facility boiler replacement. Once again, at the Pendleton Correctional Facility, we generate and distribute thermal energy to two prisons from a central powerhouse that, that produces steam. Um, the, the boilers in these particular powerhouse, in this particular powerhouse, there's four of them. They are from 51 to 62 years old. We are seeking the funding to replace the oldest and the main boiler that carries the entire base steam load for the, facil for the two facilities. The, uh, the, we've looked at numerous options. Um, our system is just too efficient. If it was far less efficient, I would be asking for uh, decentralization, as I know some other agencies have done. Our systems are still efficient. They're well, they're well uh, functioning. And this is just the modernization and the new installation of a new 400 horsepower boiler. Any questions regarding the Pendleton upgrades? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Our fifth project for today is a 4,200 bed correctional facility in Westville, Indiana. This facility has been designed to meet the current and long-term needs of the agency, including cell space, addressing the needs of our aging population, those with mental health and substance use disorder, as well as creating an efficient physical plant to help with utility and staffing and provide appropriate programming space. From the beginning, we've known this would allow us to close Westville Correctional Facility. You've heard me talk at length about that, and most of you have seen the facility, so I won't go through that again. After the budget bill passed as correctional facility upgrades for the line item, and we didn't make the June agenda, we started a lot of different discussions to review the project, as well as future capital needs. Upon 
Opening a new facility, Indiana Code 118215 requires DOC to review capacity to determine the feasibility of closing an existing facility. Our population has uh, decreased after 2014's 1006 and then again during COVID. We are seeing some slow growth, but it does make sense to look at closing another facility when the new one opens. It would allow us to avoid planned capital improvements <coughs> and significantly decrease annual operating uh, and preventative maintenance. The Indiana State Prison in Michigan City is just under 15 miles from the site of the new facility. Unlike Westville, it was built as a prison, but in 1860, which I was told today was before Abraham Lincoln was even president. Um, ADA didn't exist at that time. Concrete was the building material of choice. <coughs> It's outdated like Westville is, and the, um, it doesn't come without uh, emergency repairs on, on an annual basis, totaling about one to $2 million a year. We have more than $380 million in planned capital at that site, and the annual operating is approximately $45 million. The annual operating savings alone of closing the Indiana State Prison would create a payback of less than 20 years on this project and we avoid nearly $400 million in, in capital asks, which brings us to the narrative and the agenda that you see today. Uh, this project improves safety, security, and the lives of 1,000 staff, 4,000 incarcerated individuals, and Hoosiers. Site work has begun. The design is about 95% complete. Sewer and water systems are being brought in, and construction contracts uh, have valid bids. These funds would allow us to break ground before winter sets in. Questions? Thank you. I, I might comment. Uh, Commissioner Regal was kind enough about three weeks ago to take some of our staff and myself into the state prison and, and take a tour of that. And that, that's what convinced me it, it's the right thing. And of all the things, when we walked in behind the concrete walls and uh, five stories tall, and you look at the kind of infrastructure you have there and what needs to be done, and extremely narrow and highly, highly labor intensive. And uh, convince me $400 million in repairs, that's what sold me. And we avoid that cost by combining the two prisons, if you will, closing the two, and having it at one facility. And so, um, that's why I bring this before you. I wanted to share that with the committee. And so any questions from other, other members? Yes. Yes. Or, or, Senator, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, they are. Great. Well, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. In 2021, I supported the budget. I voted for it, including the $362 million that were included, mm -hmm. because similar to the chair, I believe that the project or the prison needs desperate repairs. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to, to us what changed since 2021 that 800 million increase, uh, it, it, there must have been major cost drivers for the additional 800 million that is that was approved in the previous in the 2023 budget. Yes, you're exactly right. It was uh, solely inflation costs. We didn't change the design. We're still in the original scope from when we had asked for that the money in 2021. Uh, through COVID and uh, supply chain changes. We, we saw the increase in, in the project of an additional $800 million. So no change in design. It was mainly just basically cost of inflation, correct? That's correct. So have you considered other finance models? Um, I, I had experience with the city of Indianapolis. They built, they financed a $572 million local jail mm -hmm. that ended up over 30 years being $1.2 billion. But because of interest rates, they staggered the bonds that they bought, given that this project is four to five years. So to reduce the cost of the 800 million, is there a way, I'm not asking you to not do the project, mm -hmm. but is there a way, have you looked at creative finance models that allow you to only cash flow the project based on your annual need? So this way you're only issuing bonds instead of, I understand that interest is high nowadays mm -hmm. and we have the cash. Um, and I've, I'm very supportive of not <coughs> borrowing. I don't like borrowing and debt, but we, we have a triple A we can come up with, with, with a creative mechanism, or if we delay the project for a year or two, I understand it's desperate. It's a desperate location, it needs help. But 800 million just for the cost of inflation seems extremely high. So we've had those discussions. Um, 
by statute, it's not up right. to me to decide that. I think with the, the new decision that we made a few weeks ago of closing the state prison and having a 20 year payback on this investment of cash, um, as a taxpayer, I, I feel like it makes sense to move forward how, how we're requesting. I appreciate you. I'll conclude by saying this. From given current market conditions, I fully agree that cash, uh, rather than borrowing, might be more, more fiscally responsible. Mm -hmm. I think the reason that gives, that gives me heartburn is that we added $800 million to build one prison just for the cost of inflation, but we funded one million students in our traditional public school by only including $900 million in this past budget. That was the increase. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't make sense to me that for 4,002 beds, we add 800 million, but for 1 million students, we only add 900 million. That, that's my issue. That's not a DOC issue. But I, I just urge you to continue to think through the finance <coughs> mechanism of this, even if it's cash and not borrowing. Mm -hmm. If you can finance or use the cash payments over the next four years, that would be helpful. But I appreciate your work. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I do have one comment, maybe a question more. Would it be fair to say that the 400 million in 2021 might have actually been short at that time even, not been enough to actually cover the cost? Yes. Okay. We, yes. We, had a, we had a designer. Uh, we had actually put those numbers together. They were put together. We had put uh, minimal investment in in in-depth in design. Um, the designer that uh, the, 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 the group that we hired to come up with that $400 million are not involved with this project today. Um, we were relying on those, but truly in our industry <coughs> across the nation, uh, we're not the only we're not the only state agency that's seen this. Uh, the state of Utah, the state of uh, Pennsylvania, they've seen the exact same uh, within our industry, the exact increases. And, and it's it's labor, but it's also electronics. The price of steel has went through the roof. Um, it's just it, it, it's it's our industry. We're we're feeling it worse. Than, than, than actually many others like a, a home builders. Okay, thank you. Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have several questions and, and comments. First of all, uh, Commissioner, it's good to see you again, Commissioner Gringo. I would, would love to have gone to Michigan City uh, with, with the Chairman uh, a few, few weeks ago, however, mm -hmm. was not afforded that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So um, as part of the Budget Committee, I, you know, I would think that someone would advise you to at least reach across the aisle also. Mm -hmm. um, we started off at $362 million in 2021. Then it went up to $1.2 billion for Westfield. Now it's back down with a name change to $800 million. Um, what and when did we decide, or you decide, or the chairman decided, or someone decided, to infuse Michigan City into that $800 million project? Um, I first want to say, so the $1.2 billion is the original $400 million plus the $800 million. So the, the total cost of the project hasn't changed from when I presented. We presented it as a total of $1.2 billion, but $400 for, for had already been. For Westfield. For, for, re, for building a new facility, knowing that we would be closing Westfield, yes. Correct. The... Um, the decision came, as I said, when um, sounds like when the bill went over to the House, the language changed. We presented the uh, bill as rebuilding Westville. It was changed to correctional facility upgrades to allow for the conversation of whether more needed to be done. At the time we started developing the budget, we were still looking at projections as well. Um, Again, we knew that there was Indiana code that required us to look at the feasibility of closing a facility once we did open that new facility. <coughs> once these conversations started after the budget bill passed, we decided to kind of kick that in high gear and start determining where might be a good place if we did close a facility that would be. So the Indiana State Prison is less than 15 miles from this site. It allows me to protect staff jobs where we don't have layoffs and uh, it just overall makes sense. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, So please. you, 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 we, well, what, a few years ago, we went from individuals saying one day serve, one, you know, one day good time, whatever, 50% to 85%. So you tell me now that we're, in, um, inmates are now serving 85% of the time and the numbers are not going up? They serve 75% of their time. 
And um, we also passed legislation that allowed us to uh, change the way that time cuts are awarded. So more individuals are utilizing programming that allows them to recognize their entire time cut. We will see an increase in the future of, because of the maximum security length of stay is longer, but lower and minimum security uh, individuals are turning over faster. So you're talking about two different populations. You're talking about Westfield, Michigan City, which, is, right. which I think are pretty two different populations. They are. How are we going to take those 4,200 um, inmates or residents, mm -hmm. Indiana residents, to how, how, how are you going to do that? Sure. So um, they are two different populations. We're building this as a maximum security facility to meet the needs for celled space. It's not that we'll take everybody from Westville and everybody from the state prison and put them into this new facility. On a daily basis, we're constantly reevaluating classifications and we transfer individuals around the state uh, to the facility that best meets their needs throughout the year. So this will continue that same process. We'll start evaluating the classifications of individuals, find who is a best fit for this new facility, and then continue transfers throughout the state. There, there are other states, I think New York, Alabama, they're building prisons, I don't know, with the population for 400 million. Mm -hmm. um, I just find it interesting that we're, we're, we're north of that tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even though if you say we're going to save money over a 20-year period or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's still astronomical in regards to uh, the dollars being spent uh, through was um, alluded to in regards to K-12 funding versus this. Uh, no, won't, won't get into that, won't get into the bonding, it's already been discussed. Mm -hmm. not, we don't, not gonna rehash it, but I'm quite sure it's being noted in, in this conversation. So help me understand, I, I know we talked about steel and everything, but, but then I hear other groups come through here and they say our costs are not as much as we anticipated. Mm -hmm. They're gone down. Why are, are your costs continue to rise? We hope they will go down. The bids are out, and as we review those, it's possible those come in lower. Um, but I also, I, I wanna um, say the size of this facility contributes to the dollar amount. We've, we've visited facilities of this similar size. All of them have been about a billion dollars. It's possible those uh, states are building smaller facilities for that amount. Uh, I haven't been to Alabama, but I've been to Utah and Pennsylvania where they just opened up facilities of this size that they saw the same escalation and ended up opening at uh, over a billion dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you. Director Jackson. I, Christina, I was just going to ask, can you, can you remind me as far as the, the, the number of jobs or just kind of what commitments have made as far as transferring jobs from, from, uh, uh, from Michigan City to to the new facility? Sure, yeah. I actually, um, when we made this decision, I canceled a vacation and went up and talked with all the staff at the state prison um, on their family day to let them know about this decision. And certainly their jobs were a big part of that. Uh, there are currently 416 staff at the Indiana State Prison. And as we combine those two, uh, we'll start working through attrition to be able to place 100% uh, of those individuals in, in the new facility. So, so nobody will be out of a job? That's correct, yeah. Thanks. Representative Delaney? Yeah, I have several uh, questions uh, for you. First of all, you did allude to the fact that we passed this 1006 in 2014 and we changed it over time. What, what is the population, what has happened to the population of each of those facilities in the time since we passed 1006? Uh, these facilities specifically, so we look at aggregate numbers. Um, I can get you what these facilities specifically uh, have done, but overall with the Department of Correction, we're down about 3,000 individuals um, in that do, time. Do you have any idea of, of the 3,000 decline in prison population? What? What percent these two facilities, these two major facilities, huh? what percentage of the 3,000 are they? I would say that for our maximum security facility for the state prison, we haven't seen a decline because we're not seeing a decline in maximum right. security okay. incarcerated so individuals. It'd be okay. Yeah, but at Westville, uh, their current population. <coughs> 
is uh, right around 2,500, and they were close to 3,400, 3,200, 3,400 prior. Okay, and have you done the math as to, <laughs> this is what you would do with an apartment building or a house, have you done the math as to how much it's gonna cost us to house one prisoner? Yes. Yeah, so Under this $1.2 billion, what's that work out to? Uh, it, so the pop, the per diem will remain the same as our as our current. We'll have, um, well, I say it'll remain the same, but we'll have a higher number and lower cost. So it'll it'll go down slightly, but it's it isn't going to have a significant impact on the per diem. It will remain about the same as Meaning we have the operational cost. I'm talking about the housing costs. Okay, how many how many dollars per square foot are you paying, or uh, how much per prisoner for the capital cost? Okay. of constructing this facility. Okay, this is a how many square feet facility? 1.4 million square feet. 1.4 million square feet. Well, we can do the math. All right. Yeah. All right, so that's, I'm thinking, Dollars. is that $100,000 a, a room? <laughs> this is a nice hotel. I okay. Uh, that would be a I, I'm very, very interested in the policy here. Um, <coughs> you indicated that the <coughs> conversation, that was your word, conversation, shifted at some point. Mm -hmm. I was on the Ways and Means Committee, and I don't remember being advised that we were suddenly talking about two prisons rather than one prison. When, when did this conversation change and you come up with the idea that we'll close Michigan City? So those were internal conversations ah. that we had, yeah. So when we passed the budget, we were on the committee, the Ways and Means Committee, and the members were not informed mm -hmm. that as a part of the project, you were going to eliminate one of our prisons. That was not on the table at the time. Uh -huh. And that was not discussed with us. No. Okay. So now within the internally. money, though, curiously, mm -hmm. you now found a way to close this other facility. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how is that possible? How, what, what was the light that suddenly came to you that you didn't share with us in uh, our discussions earlier this year? We didn't have plans to do it earlier in this year. That is why I didn't <clears throat> share it earlier this year. When the language changed, and when we didn't make the June committee, because there were still reservations about the project, we started digging deeper. And what, what language change was that you're talking about? We submitted this as, as rebuilding Westville Correctional Facility. The language that was approved in the budget bill is correctional facility upgrades. And, and you, didn't know, you didn't know at the time that, the ability, that instead of dealing with one place, you were dealing with two. You didn't know that. No, I didn't. Okay. Right. Yes, yeah. if, if I may. Yeah, please. Uh, at the point when the budget passed, I was not convinced that $1.2 billion to replace Westville was the right thing to do. And I was insistent on the language that was in there. And the discussions since then have been we can close the state prison also and save $400 million. That convinced me all of a sudden the project really cost <coughs> $800 million not 1.2 billion because we can save all those dollars and once i got behind the scenes if you will up in the state prison and saw with my own eyes what the structure looked like and 150 or 60 years old it convinced me that that was the thing to do the significant savings in operational costs and then really looking at 800 million for one prison that will close the two and that's when I come on board. So I was not on board when the, at the okay. end of sessions. I was insistent on that language. That, that's on me, if the, you will. The broader language, the open language. Yes, I, I wanted the broad because I okay. knew there was other <coughs> options we might look at in place of building a new okay. Westville. And now you've got me confused on another point. Are we spending $800 million or 800 plus 362? We're spending the total 1.2, but the but is we're saving the 400 million that must go into the state prison if we're going to continue on. It, it's got to be. In what way are we saving it? Because we'll have to have all that investment in the infrastructure that's behind those walls I talked right. about a while ago, right. and it's going to be highly, highly labor ah. intensive. You're, you're saving the radical cost of fixing Michigan City. And is that what still, you're saying? And we still have a 150 okay. or 60 year old prison okay. that's okay. been upgraded. I, I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> yeah. you're, 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 that cost, which we would have been incurring, we're not. That is correct. Okay. Uh, th this is a very interesting uh, evolution, to say the least. Uh, was there local input on this, uh, ma'am, with the, the local 
like the city council, the county council, were they informed that you were going to close uh, their prison? Yeah, so we, our communication plan was that I would talk with our staff and then we would talk with the locals. Um, this isn't a new topic by any means. Um, the closing of the Indiana State Prison is something that the locals have been pushing for for a long time. Okay. Um, and I, I have had conversations with um, legislators in the, where that Westville sits right now. Um, to speak with them about that as well. Okay, thank you for that. And, and I think the last thing that interested me was, did somebody get fired as the designer of this facility in Westville? <clears throat> no, I think, are you referring to what Kevin yeah, had mentioned? Yeah. Did they just disappear or get fired yeah. or? They didn't no. get rehired. They didn't get rehired. <laughs> get Their re contract <laughs> Well, <expired>. okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were fired. So they were fired, but we're gonna call it a nice term. Uh, were they wildly wrong in their estimate? Is that the reason that they've moved on? I don't think that they were wildly wrong. I think that we have a much better product and we have a much better team working on this now. And maybe this is a sort of a technical question. I get the sense we're gonna put in a lot more electronic technologies change. There's gonna be a lot more electronics in this yes. place. I assume that's a big part of the cost. <coughs> it is. That, and that's not a matter of inflation alone. That's also a matter of improvement, right? It is, and yeah, that's what creates the staffing efficiencies. President Delaney, okay. yeah. I was up there, and they have mechanical. It, it's yeah. mechanical you know, operation to close the doors. Oh, it, it's not electronic. It's, yeah. it's we're gonna be very, in the very brave. old, <laughs> old, if you will, yeah. technology. We're going to pay money for the electronics. It's not okay. just for the cement. Yes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner and Kevin. So we're still talking about $1.2 billion. But now we still, but we we added Michigan City to the equation. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the person, the, the group that you had doing the the estimates really weren't wrong. Uh, so they, I don't think they they weren't wrong because you're still looking at 1.2 billion dollars. But you you've added in the equation Michigan City to it. That's not the so the group that didn't continue is the one who did the original 400 million dollar request. That contract ended. We hired new individuals to come in. And they reviewed, went to the 1.2 billion. And they, went, they are the ones who valued at 1.2 billion after for, the for inflation West, as well. For, for Westville only? For the new facility. Yes. Which was Westville, 1.2 billion for Westville only at that time? The new facility in Westville, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because Westville but we didn't was change a mental the number institution. Of beds or and they <coughs> converted to <coughs> inmates. Okay. Yep. I mean, I mean, this, you know. Is the, I, I, I kind of chill, I'm not that slow, just trying to, you know, understand, you know, the, the magical part of this financing and how we put it all together and then coming back and coming back to 1.2 billion, then we're going to deal with Michigan City and the locals are okay with it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm just expressing my concern. I don't, you know, I, I'm just trying to watch people, the taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure it's done correctly and that, you know, uh, those individuals do get <laughs> services they need if and when they transition back. Because we know that since COVID, <clears throat> things are be beginning to go back up uh, in regards to being, people being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. it's, things are being a lot more punitive mm -hmm. uh, here, here in the state of Indiana. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, just want to <clears throat> express my concerns and... Uh, and my dismay for, and may, I don't want to go Michigan City now, but you know, I wish I would have been able to go to Michigan City uh, with, with you or whoever, uh, if you would have afforded us the opportunity, which I must have not saw the email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. S Senator Garten. Garton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't have a microphone, so somebody tell me if, if I'm not coming through, generally, generally being loud and volume isn't my issue, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just, just a couple comments uh, to the group. Um, Representative Porter, I'll kind of start with a little bit of rebuttal if it makes you feel better. I didn't get an invite or an email either, so it, rest assured it was not partisan. Um, I didn't get an opportunity to attend either, so I, I think it's important for folks to know that. Uh, so there's a couple things to consider here. We keep talking about cost savings, annual savings. Um, this committee just approved earlier in this meeting already uh, number 10, an adjutant general's office request in the Martinville addition and alteration of a of a, uh, a project that increased over 100%. Nobody raised questions about that one. And so um, 
there's a there's a definitive trend here, obviously, in inflationary costs and adjustments. To that point, the other thing that I think the nuance of the numbers that hasn't been focused on or pointed out here is we're talking, uh, there's a nuance between capital and operating expenses. Uh, we keep talking about capital, which are one-time dollars. Well, what we're not talking about or what we haven't focused on is operating expenses, which are ongoing. And so it's important to talk about when we talk about this return to really pay attention and focus on the return on the operating expense because that is an ongoing expense to taxpayers in the state of Indiana. So I think that's, I think that's a critical point that we haven't spent much time on um, with, this other con with regards to this conversation this morning. Uh, and just lastly, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, the other thing that I haven't heard mentioned uh, is the effectiveness, the efficiency, uh, the health, welfare, and safety of not only our prisoners uh, that are housed there, but our officers and the general public. Uh, by building this new facility, our officers that serve to protect us are going to operate in a significantly safer environment. Their risk assessment every day goes down in not only protecting the general public, but protecting the Hoosiers and, and really Americans that are housed there. And we have to consider that in this equation. I understand this is a fiscal body, but these are lives we're talking about, and that hasn't been mentioned. And so not only is there a cost savings to the Hoosier taxpayer, there is a health and welfare significant savings, and the risk assessment decreases significantly uh, to the Hoosiers that work there and the folks that are serving there. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Senator Cadora. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because I already spoke. Um, uh, I agree with Senator Garth National very thoughtful, and I appreciate your comments. I also want to thank the chairman for his transparency because it helps clarify what happened, and that's sometimes why we question, we raise questions because we were not um, informed about some of these changes. But I think the the part that I just want to confirm, I wanted to maintain an open mind. That's why my first question was, is the 800 million purely cost of inflation, or did the design change? The answer that I heard was it was purely cost of inflation. And then the following 15-minute discussion was, no, we're combining facilities, high technology uh, cost, and all of that. So I just want to confirm that which one is it? Is it that the is it purely cost of inflation or all of the 15-minute the discussion about actual design change? Our original design didn't change. We didn't increase technology requirements or, or anything of that matter. So we still have the same plans that we had when we came for the $400 million. Got it. So, to, um, so the $800 million is purely inflation cost? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, thank you. I do want to make one comment. I've been now through three different prisons, and without exception, even though they've been very old facilities, they've been very clean, and the staff has been wonderful. And that's a reflection on leadership, and I, I appreciate that because that's what we should expect. Yeah, that, that's expected, but you do that, and I appreciate that. Any further comments? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have Department of Natural Resources, please. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. So DNR has a total of three projects on the agenda today. The first request is for our uh, President Benjamin Harrison Conservation Trust, or as we refer to it as the PBHCT. So this funding supports the conservation of the natural and cultural heritage of Indiana through land acquisition and easements. The PBHCT is overseen by a committee representing five geographic regions, the uh, specific recreational user groups, Four members of the General Assembly, Director Bortner of DNR, Indiana State Museum, and Historic Site CEO. The land acquired and managed th through the PBHCT protects endangered species, it preserves wetlands, protects historic sites, and it's critical for long-term planning and the conservation efforts to keep these lands healthy and accessible for our Hoosiers. Thank you. Any questions? Continue, please. All right. So the next one is a request for a bulk purchase of rubber mulch for various playgrounds around the state. 
This involves purchasing 240,000 669 cubic feet of rubber mulch for 138 playgrounds. The rubber mulch is safer and more cost effective alternative than the traditional wood chips, wood chips that we use. It reduces upkeep and maintenance by having a life expectancy of 12 years compared to three years. It deters weeds and grass from growing. And then the other playground work that we'd have to do, site repairs, borders, we'll just handle that internally with our operating and maintenance funds. Thank you. Any questions? Can you please? And the last project is a collaborative project with DNR and Indiana Destination Development Corporation. This is the funding to rehabilitate the Lincoln Amphitheater at Lincoln State Park. So the funding request for design work was previously reviewed and approved by this body in October of 2022. This project will include improving the parking lot surface, lighting, rehabilitation, storm sewers, constructing two additional restrooms, remodeling the existing structures, removing wood siding, replacing this synthetic siding, ADA accessibility, and what we're most excited about, adding the additional seating for 1,004 visitors, uh, constructing new viewing decks, sidewalks, fencing. Uh, the Construction for this will take it take place in between the closed tourist season. Any questions? Yes, Representative Senator Garden. Uh, Mr. Chair, just just want to point out um, in October 2022, this particular project was 290,500. And so, for those of you keeping track at home, again, with regards to my earlier comments, there's a consistent trend here of an inflationary expenses that we're gonna to have to continue to adjust for. So. so that was for the design work. So we had to get some money for the design to figure out what the total cost would actually be. Um, we really, really hope that 4.6 takes care of this. Right. So, um, so I was getting to that, so I'm glad, <laughs> glad you pointed it out. That's where we were going, thank you. Yep, yeah, hopefully we can live within this. We've let them know um, this hasn't went to bid yet, but when it does, we have 4.6, so we have to do our best to live within that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, go ahead. Th th right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Department of Toxicology, the Indiana State Department of Toxicology. Hello, thank you, Chairman and the committee. Uh, my name is Tina Beamer. I'm the director at the Indiana State Department of Toxicology. Uh, for a little bit of background, uh, we are responsible for performing forensic analysis of blood samples for the presence of alcohol or drugs in criminal investigations, such as DUI, sexual assaults, homicides, and death investigations. We are a separate laboratory from the state police, although we are in the same facility at West 16th Street in Indianapolis. Um, we became a state agency in 2012. Prior to that, we were under the IU School of Medicine. In 2012, we received under 6,000 cases that year for analysis. Uh, for 2023, we're on track to receive 15,000 cases, so close to a 250% increase in case submissions. Um, so because of this, our laboratory needs additional staffing and instrumentation to keep up with the increasing in cases. This funding is being requested to remodel our office to provide additional desk space for our growing staff, as well as to purchase instrumentation that will allow us, allow us to perform drug screening for our increased caseload. These efforts will significantly reduce our backlog in case turnaround times and um, will limit the number of cases that we need to outsource to a private laboratory. We'll be working with IDOA for the planning and renovations. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Representative Porter. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sandy, um, so you will reduce the backlog. So how, are, are you backlog now? We are. How, to the tune of what? Currently, our turnaround time for drug analysis is about six to eight months. Six to eight months? Correct. And this will eliminate it by how much? You're uh, hoping? This will get us back to a two to three month turnaround time. Is that, is that an average, is that normal, two to three months? For a drug analysis, it can be because we do a screen analysis and then we might have to do multiple tests thereafter depending on what those results are. So, if, Mr. Chairman, yes. so course. any cases that you have, that legal cases, that, that means they're sitting there waiting for six to eight months for the analysis to come back Correct. to be used for any, for guilty or non-guilty? Currently, yes. Currently. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Senator. Yes. Enlightening. Garten. Yes. Senator Garten, go ahead, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a sort of a follow up to Representative Porter's question. So at that six to eight months, where does that fall or rank nationally? Um, it is definitely on the high side. I'm okay. not sure um, what the national average is, but I believe that most laboratories get drug and alcohol in about three to four months. Um, we've had backlogs up to 12 months before, um, so it's definitely on the high side. So, so I would ask you just to validate that for us if you could. I think that's important sure. context. And then just as a follow on to that, that's a segue into my next question. When we, hopefully when we get that down to that two to three month time frame, yes. where does that put us nationally? And it sounds like you kind of made a general blanket statement of three to four months. So if we're at two to three, I've got to assume that's kind of under the national average. So. I think through your validation work on the first part of my question will kind of validate the second part as well. So, sure thank thing. You. Thank you. Yes, Director Victor Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you just remind me? It was the, the decision to move this from from IU School of Medicine over. Was that was that an accreditation concern, or was that a, a significant backlog concern? And, and if it was backlog, you you were. Do you know what type of backlogs they were running up against whenever this transitioned? I'm not sure what their backlogs were at that point in time. That was before I was with the agency. Um, but a lot of the reasons why we became a state agency is because of operational um, concerns and, and issues that needed to be addressed. Um, when we did become a state agency, everything that was in the backlog at that point in time was outsourced. And so the agency kind of started with a zero backlog. Um, over the years, our cases have continued to increase, and that's why we are where we are. Thank you. Representative Delaney. I'm not terribly interested in competing with the other states. I'm interested in how is it that we went from being able to do it in two to three months so that we can't do it till four to six months. What happened to cause that change? Sure. Uh, a lot of it is our caseload. Uh, when we were at a uh, three to four month turnaround time, we had about 10,000 total cases. Right now we're aiming at 15,000 cases. We were also outsourcing a significant amount of that, which was grant, most of that was grant funded. Uh, in 2018, we spent $1.7 million to outsource our testing. Um, and that significantly reduced our backlog, but as we've continued to increase in cases, we've not been able to keep up with all of the case that, com that comes in. Have you done any analysis of what it costs the, the defendants and the, and the jails to get delayed results? I'm not sure what those costs would be. There would presumably be some impact, would there not? If people are sitting in jail waiting the analysis, yes. And, and what caused the reduction in outsourcing? Why aren't you outsourcing to get caught up? We are outsourcing currently to get caught back up. Uh, the long-term goal would be to perform all of the testing in-house, so that way we don't have to rely on outsourcing the testing. And, and what percentage are you outsourcing? About 10% of our cases are being outsourced right now. And before you took over, what percent was outsourced? Hmm. I think we've been about similar. Uh, in 2018, we, I think, outsourced probably 80% of our backlog at that point. Okay. And uh, is there an increase in crime? Is, is some of the backlog because of an increase in crime rather than just slow procedure? It could be. Um, I'm not sure if there has been an increase in DUIs. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Joel Thacker, Executive Director, Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we're excited to be here this morning to discuss uh, important work we're doing uh, throughout the state to improve fire service training. Uh, this program before you aims to increase the number of hands-on firefighter training facilities by strategically placing them throughout the state in areas of greatest need. Uh, through this program, IDHS and using the state funds would pay for the construction of firefighter training towers, live burn facilities to provide hands-on firefighter training. In turn, our hosting communities would provide land and responsibility for maintenance and operation of these facilities. And in order to maximize the state's investment, we would ask the hosting community to allow Indiana local fire departments to train there at, at no charge. Uh, the intent of this program is to increase access to quality firefighter training facilities, 
High quality training not only benefits the firefighters, but also Hoosiers that depend on them for their safety. Thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yes, Senator Garton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation and the opportunity to be here today. Um, just, just real quick, help me understand, kind of talk me through, is there a check and balance in place just to make sure that we're not going to overbuild services geographically that may already be offered in certain areas of the state? Yeah, we have, we have been out all over the state uh, to confirm other locations. You know, we, we have 10 uh, district training sites. There are other uh, local training sites that we're uncovering almost every day that, that we didn't know about. Good. So really, as, as we look at these areas of greatest need, we're physically going there. We're talking with our county commissioners, county council, mayors, all locals to making sure that we're not uh, oversaturating areas. And then, you know, work with <clears throat> others that may already be in existence to maybe do some enhancement down the road. Yeah. Thank you. And then just one last question. You started to touch on it. Um, organically, but I'm just going to ask you, has there been a comprehensive review, sort of an inventory of training facilities statewide in this space? And do we know kind of one, where they are, two, what can they offer? And three, is it enough? Yeah. So, and that's being done right now. We just met um, earlier this week, Wednesday actually, and, uh, and our academy staff are, have been out again, inventorying those uh, to really understand, okay, they have some shipping containers <laughs> and they have some props but they can't really complete all of the necessary skills for that basic firefighter level. So I think really for the first time ever, we're developing that list that you're asking about. And that's gonna help us make better decisions down the road. I would ask that when that's complete, if you could share that with, with us, I think Absolutely. that'd be fantastic for us to know um, really what services, training capabilities are in our districts and our areas. So. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, I believe we have the Indiana State Police. Good morning, commit, committee and chairman. I'm here to uh, represent, represent the Indiana State Police requesting the funding for replacing uh, the radios the troopers carry. Uh, the requested amount is $23,250,000. I might ask if we had some conversations I know back, back during session, and this should be roughly how many years would you be an estimate that this, this would provide an upgrade for? This is going to give us 10 years. This is going to give us a, a, 10 years of actually replacing our radio. We have radios that are between 10 and 15 years old. We got some that are 19 years old. And the ones that I'm carrying right now is uh, we're approaching 10 years on it. And it'll give us a technology that will actually help us also because right now with the encryption that we do not have with these radios, it's going to make us better. Thank you. Same answer I got a few months back. Thank you. No problem. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the Alcohol and Tobacco Commission. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I'm Jessica Allen, Chairwoman of the Indian Alcohol and Tobacco Commission. Similar to the last um, presentation, we're here requesting law enforcement radios on behalf of Indiana State Excise Police. Um, similar to the last presentation, some of our radios are actually about 23 years old. Um, so we are looking at replacing those. Um, total cost is 1.1. 850,000 of which will require state funding. Any questions? Questions? Representing Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Allen, for being here. Um, previously, right, we, we did take a um, $23 million general fund. My question is, um, when, I, when I look through this again, um, we're taking tobacco master settlement dollars, uh, $850 million, right? I mean, thousand, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I, why did you, were you able to take, say where you want the dollars to come from? Could we not take this out of general fund and maybe use that other dollars to fund like doulas and other, other health care issues that we have? So I think Zach Jackson may have answers on that. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Jackson, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Porter, when the agency submitted this project um, during budget development, I, I don't know that they really requested a specific funding source, but as we were piecing things together with the budget, um, in, in I think every version of the budget, 
governor's uh, house, senate, conference committee, it was in there as a tobacco master settlement fund appropriation. Okay, okay thank you. And it was there, and again, however, I, I, mean, I would wonder if we could have, someone had some foresight, and might have been on me, but why would we not look at, uh, we got $3 billion surplus, I mean, we could have funded this out, out of that and put more money to, <clears throat> into health care uh, initiative that we have in the state. Uh, I mean, so it was, you know, $850 million is, is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of a $45 billion budget over biennium, but I, I think it's, it's important that we uh, look at that. I'm just trying to keep health care out there and doulas and uh, health disparities out here on, on the forefront because it's, it's very important and it's no difference to you. It's, uh, it's, it's the process that we have to challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Indiana Department of Transportation. Morning, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. I am Scott Hinderman. I'm the executive director of the Fort Wayne Allen County Airport Authority. And Marty, uh, don't know your title, but uh, Office of Aviation uh, for INDOT. That's it. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that ha happens to me quite often, so don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> I guess I want to talk about our project gateway. Uh, we are requesting $5 million to support our uh, gateway, and project gateway is our renovation of our terminal building, <laughs> renovation, and expansion. Uh, we have, uh, d we're doing this in two phases. Phase west of the building is, uh, was a two-year project two years because of the sequencing that we could, could we continue to operate in the building. It wasn't two years of construction. If we could have just gave it to the contractor, but it's like remodeling your house. You have to live in it at the same time. Uh, that is done this year, and the Project Gateway East uh, was going to be phase two and three. We've been able to merge that, and by doing so, we'll get the project done in the next two years as opposed to the next four, therefore saving money because of, of inflation. Along with a multitude of uh, uh, inefficiencies and inadequacies of the airport. Uh, the project, our terminal building is a 1950s model. Uh, we have had, Northeast Indiana has had growth for uh, the last several years. The airport has seen 10 years of growth and we are now being served with aircraft that have larger wingspans and length. Uh, so we can't use all eight gates at the terminal building at the same time because wingtip conflicts with, with where the gate positions are. Uh, this project is putting additional lineal feet as well as moving the terminal gate areas closer and farther away from the taxiways because the length of the aircraft, when the ground support equipment is going around it, they are actually encroaching on taxiways, uh, which is a violation of federal FAA standards. Uh, as well as our TSA checkpoint does not meet the guidelines and FAA, or excuse me, TSA regulation, uh, this project mitigates all that. I will say our project gateway east is a total in $73 million. Uh, we have 57% is federal. 6.8% is state and 36% is local. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have of me. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, okay. Next, we have the state <clears throat> psychiatric hospital network. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the State Budget Committee. Uh, my, it's nice to see you guys again. Uh, my name is Jeff Wedding. I'm the Director of Operations for the Indiana State Psychiatric Hospital Network, which operates under the FSSA's Division of Mental Health and Addiction. I'm here today to discuss three appropriated projects for our hospital network. The first two projects are on the Logansport State Hospital campus. Uh, Logansport State Hospital is located on 160 acres in Logansport, Indiana and it's been serving Indiana citizens with serious mental illness since 1888. Uh, they did just proudly celebrate their 135th anniversary last week, so we're ex pretty excited about that. Uh, the first project needed at Logansport is for the replacement of a roof on Building 102. This functions as their laundry, housekeeping, and materials management hub. The existing roof is 46 years old and has surpassed its useful life. At this time, the roof has numerous long cracks, tears, and leaks that are beyond what patching can handle. 
The current concern is for potential water damage to sterile items that are kept in that building uh, for medical care of our patients. The scope of the project involves replacement of 13,177 square feet of roofing material. Uh, it's a roll rubber uh, bitumen uh, roofing material. New aluminum flashing, scuppers, gutters, and downspouts. It also includes the removal and disposal of existing roofing material. The Logansport State Hospital staff are prepared to begin this project as soon as possible as the conditions do continue to deteriorate. We are seeking the release of $612,600 appropriated for this project to, with work to be completed by JOC roofing contractor. Any questions on that project? Questions? Representative Porter? Thank, thank you very much. Um, I know we visited the state budget agency uh, committee vid, went there a couple, two or three years ago. Um, and during our, our uh, visit there, there were several wings that were not being utilized. Are those wings being utilized now? Yes, Representative Porter, they are. Uh, those wings at the time were closed down for a anti-ligature project. Uh, we actually had to close those to mitigate the risk for ligature in those mm -hmm. areas. And I'm ha very happy to report they are open back up. Okay, th so does this roof, go is that part of that wings? This particular one is in a non-patient area. Non-patient, uh, okay. Correct, yes. Uh, but they are being utilized now? Yes, sir. Good, yes. thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Further questions? Can you please? Yeah. The second appropriated project uh, that I'm here today is for also for Logansport State Hospital to pursue their F building generator project. This project entails the removal and replacement of a diesel generator inside F building, uh, also referred to as building 108. This houses the mechanical operations of Logansport State Hospital. This generator has been in place since the F building was constructed in 1993. In addition to supplying emergency power to this building, the generator also supplies the Larson Treatment Center, uh, which is a patient access area, uh, staff development where the training of staff take place, and the administration building. Uh, a Kohler diesel generator that is currently in place has uh, far surpassed its useful lifespan of 20 years and is beginning to fail. Transfer switches in the diesel tank can no longer carry the 30% required for load bank testing. Uh, we do have a scope of work in place to include the installation of a new standalone generator and new automatic transfer switch. Additionally, a new, the new generator will be planned to be built outside of the building as is now standard uh, where some generators were built inside of buildings. The Logan support team is ready to pursue this project upon release of these funds as the generator presently does not meet the demands uh, for the hospital. For this project, we are seeking the release of $296,393. Logan Support State Hospital will work with a JOC mechanical contractor, Sexton Mechanical, and DPW to ensure the work is completed. Questions? Can you please? Okay. The last project needed is for our Richmond State Hospital campus. Uh, Richmond State Hospital is located on 110 acres in Richmond, Indiana, and has also been serving fellow citizens with serious mental illness since 1890. Richmond State Hospital is requesting to pursue their roof repair and replacement project. This project entails the replacement of the 19,480 square foot roof on building 511, which is home to the residential treatment center, which does house our patients. Priority is going to this building with the scope of work to include installation of standing seam metal roof, new aluminum flashing, fascia, gutters, and downspouts. There are also 13 other uh, roofs on this campus that will be patched at this particular point in time as part of this project in order to prolong the life of those roofs until we can find a more efficient long-term solution. Some of these buildings were constructed in the early 1900s and include slate roofing, which is why we have to get creative with, with patchwork at this time. Each of the 14 buildings have been deemed to be viable, valuable assets and must be protected from the elements. The aforementioned buildings are currently experiencing leaking roofs, uh, failing roof material, falling slate tiles, and are of course well beyond their useful life expectancy. As a cost saving measure, uh, the Richmond State Hospital uh, staff have been working to patch these roofs uh, to sort of mitigate the risk in the meantime. Uh, Richmond team is prepared to pursue this project upon release of these funds as the conditions do continue to deteriorate. And we are seeking the release of 1.5 million <coughs> appropriated for this project. Uh, also working with JOC roofing contractors. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Right. Thank you all.
Next, we have the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Budget Committee. Uh, this morning, the IEDC is requesting the release of $120 million in funding from the deal closing appropriation included in this year's budget to provide a performance-based grant in support of a $3.2 billion investment in North Central Indiana. Project Sundried involves a company in the advanced technology automotive components sector, building on the momentum Indiana has in this space over the last few years and raising the level of investment in new next generation auto manufacturing facilities in the state to over $9 billion. As part of this project, the company is also committed to create approximately 1,400 high quality jobs for area residents. These jobs are expected to provide a wage in excess of the local, state, and national average wage. The grant will be provided to the company over an eight-year period in accordance with negotiated schedule, and as the company achieves capital investment, job creation, and wage benchmarks as provided in the IEDC's final agreement for public financial resources. Thanks to your support and the allocation of resources to the IEDC and by establishing impactful investment tools, Indiana has attracted unprecedented investment in future-focused industries and has empowered the organization to pursue transformative investments like this that will benefit the state for years to come. I appreciate the time this morning and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Senator Kodora. Th th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I appreciate our recent meeting to discuss the project. <clears throat> to confirm a couple of things. One, you are not at the phase where you can disclose what that project is publicly, correct? That's correct. Um, the second question, uh, which inter we talked briefly about in our meeting, uh, before this body, as we analyze the impact of this project, one missing component of the matrix that you use to evaluate these projects is the local tax abatement, which is a local issue. That's why you don't include it in the IEDC formula <laughs> or in the matrix. But it would be helpful for us as a body as we evaluate our investment when we uh, include facts about, for example, this, this potential uh, company will invest $3 billion. We don't know how much of that was abated in terms of property taxes locally. Um, do you have the, any updates on how much the locals abated as far as property taxes, or is that a future information? Um, I have not been able to get the detail on that, Senator, but I will get it to you as soon as I have. I but the that. local community, in, in conversations with them and the company, uh, they are committing to helping to, to incentivize the project. I appreciate that. That will help us understand the full, when you analyze the full investment by the state and the locals per job, it will help us understand the return on investment, not only from IEDC's perspective, but also when we look at the local dollars. The, uh, the, the last question I have, in the June budget meeting, um, and I'm so sorry that I did not ask that question in our meeting because I, did not, uh, I was not taught, prepared to discuss the June meeting, but you requested $122 million for a potential deal. We were competing with another state, mm -hmm. and we had discussion about whether or not that money, where does it revert and what happens. Do, do you have, since it's been two months, do you have any updates if we finalize that deal, or where are we on that deal? Uh, we have not finalized it yet, no. But the negotiations are still ongoing, yes. and we are still in play, potentially, to, to win that, um, that company, correct? Yes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Porter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, j just a couple of questions we have. Um, again, here we are uh, talking about another uh, $120 million. Uh, another secret squirrel type of movement here. Um, my, my question is, you know, is there, is there going to be opportunity to have more transparency? And I understand, you know, you're going at your, at your company, you don't want you don't, you don't to let the uh, competitors in other states uh, know what's going on. But, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's taxpayer dollars, and I understand business, uh, you know, period. But I'm very, still very concerned about the, the, this transparency uh, of what's, what's happening, particularly with some of the leadership within the state that, that allocates those dollars. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, how we can be involved and just know what is going on uh, in, in general, not just in a uh, global, like, it may, it may happen, it may, this may happen, and, and it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, the return on investment on the out years. You know, what happened? I mean, that, it, it happens all the time. We do a big splash on, 
a project coming, and then three or five years later, no, one, everyone's forgot because some of you, some people have moved on, and but then we never know whatever happened to that, that initial investment. Uh, and I think, Mr. Chairman, there's some way we need to understand what is the real return on investment that we give these companies that come here, and what do they really create here in the state of Indiana and for those local communities. And last but not least, my question is, so when you put together these packages, how, how does it incorporate those other company, uh, other incentives locally, if it's uh, EDGE grant or, you know, in, in any of those incentives? Because this is $120 million, but it's not just $120 million to close the deal. It's also other dollars that, in, that are involved in attracting and re, uh, recruiting, retaining, and, uh, and keeping that, that, that company mm -hmm. here that we are going after. And I, I think that's important that that should be, so I, from my perspective, be part of your package for, for full transparency. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know your thoughts on that. No, I, I appreciate that, Representative Porter. And um, you know, with this project in particular, there was um, an elevated level of concern about um, any information being released publicly prior to the company uh, notifying their shareholders and, and having a public announcement. Uh, so that, that was what was in part driven by, by the company. But um, you know, on, on your first question around you know, a, a continuous evaluation of the projects and the investment that the state makes, um, each year the IEDC um, does a look back on every single active project that we have. Uh, to determine um, both compliance with the terms of the agreement, uh, the level of performance under those agreements, um, and the amount of incentives that have been contributed to that as compared to the new withholdings that were generated by the jobs that the company created. So we do that on an annual rolling basis, uh, provide it to the legislature each year, um, and also make it public on our transparency portal as well. Uh, but even before that, uh, the IEDC undertakes a, an extensive due diligence and uh, return on investment analysis to ensure that um, as the company invests and creates new jobs, the amount of revenues that are generated by that activity, as well as uh, the ripple effects of that project in the location of new suppliers, creation of additional jobs, and supporting uh, the local economy around the facility, uh, that, that we do realize a return on investment and continue to generate additional revenue for the state of Indiana. Representative Delaney. Mark, a clarification question. You, you, this proposal is $3.2 billion, I believe. You alluded to $9 billion. Mm -hmm. what, did that number relate to this same project or a group of projects? A group of projects. So, so within the last 12 months, okay. we've had But this over particular $9 project is $3.2 billion. That's correct. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at the text of the statute, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm having trouble figuring out what we know more than the language of the statute mm -hmm. today. I'm having trouble understanding what we're approving. Because we already put in the law that we'll give you $500 million for the deal closing fund. Okay. Correct. That's already there. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is asking to take a part of that, $120 million. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, but you're not telling us where this facility will be. Is that right? Correct. You're not telling us when it will be built, right? We anticipate um, you know, the project to move forward within the next year. That, that's Fairly vague, okay. Uh, how many employees are gonna be employed? 1,400. That's a commitment or a current estimate? That is what they've committed to. They've committed to this, mm -hmm. okay. All right, so that, that's helpful. And if I understand uh, what you say here in, in today's proposal, you don't <coughs> actually pay that $120 million till they actually have people employed. That's correct. And you pay them based on the actual performance. Mm -hmm. Just like all of our other incentives, okay. yes. So why do we need to approve this today? Uh, there the, is a provision within the budget that does require review by the budget committee yeah, before the you, funds. You can missed be my key word. Why do we have to approve this today? Uh, the, with no, the let me finish. With yeah. no more information than we had when we passed the budget. Mm -hmm. So the company has accepted our offer, ah. um, and to move into uh, finalizing those agreements, uh, we need to ensure that we do have access to the funding to be able to encumber it. So we're showing our bona fides, as it were, mm -hmm. by putting our money, in effect, in a reserve That's correct. for this particular purpose. Yes. Okay. All right, so I do know something I didn't know before. All right, is there anything else that we, we've learned since the budget passed that you could share with me, other than the fact that you've signed a deal? Uh, 
there's been um, you know continued like robust attention provided to Indiana. Um, we have a significant pipeline of projects. No, that, I mean about this yeah. project. I know you guys got all kinds of projects, mm -hmm. and God love you. But on this project, anything more you can tell me about this project? Nothing more I can share right. at this time. Well, I appreciate what you have told me. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Isn't it true that federal security laws, and I'm no expert by any means, really <coughs> confine what you can and cannot say at this point? That's correct. And I, it's a great question, Dr. Yeah. Delaney, because yeah. you really describe what's I going on. That. This is performance-based. Right. If they don't perform, <coughs> they'll never receive that. And yeah, so I, I think <coughs> that's critical. That gives me comfort that I wouldn't otherwise have. And I'm totally, well, not totally, I'm reasonably <laughs> familiar with the securities law. And this apparently is a significant transaction, so it's, quote, material. Yes, and right. so I, I understand all those things. I think the important <coughs> thing we've learned is that apparently this deal, whatever it is, wherever it is, whoever it is, is moving along. Yeah. It's no secret. That's, that is news to me since we passed the budget. I, I've asked them that whatever they can by law disclose. I mean, that, right. it should be, be there, and that's yeah. the expectation. Okay. <coughs> all right, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Senator Garton. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thanks for being here today. Just just a couple of points um, that I want to make. You know, you and your team have done a fantastic job sort of taking the lead on recruiting industry and business and opportunity to Indiana. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, I, I think it's I think it's very natural uh, for members of this committee and members of our bodies, uh, respectively, across each chamber, uh, to, to default to transparency. Uh, the one thing that I want to continue to point out some of which has been mentioned, is there are non-disclosures in place um, at multiple different levels. And so we've got to be respectful of that. We've got to be, um, we, we've got to be willing to, to recognize that. Um, again, this has been mentioned, but, but it's important to note that all of these agreements come with performance-based matrices, right? And we're measuring those, and we're not turning dollars over until those benchmarks are hit. And so that gives me some level um, that, you know, that gives me some, some um, I guess, level of, of security in these, these transactions. Uh, with regards to shareholders, and it was just clarified with Representative Delaney and Representative Thompson, again, when there's shareholders involved, there's another added layer of complexities um, in dealing with, with federal security laws. And so you couple that with NDAs involved um, and all the other things that come into this, this becomes very complex. It's a, it's a big ball of yarn and, and many multiple moving targets. Um, but, but it's also important to note that, that our IEDC is sort of a quasi-government entity um, that we've tasked with being the lead recruiter at Indiana, and we've really tasked you guys with moving as a quasi-government agency, but moving at the speed of private business and private development, and that's a tough task to do, um, especially with NDAs and, and federal security laws in place. And so the other thing to note that I don't know that's been mentioned, um, and if it's redundant, I apologize, Mr. Chair, but if something goes awry on these deals, my understanding is that these funds do revert back into the same pool and there is a pipeline of other deals that are ready to go. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, and, and then again, it's just important for us to note that really in today's development space, speed is the new incentive. And I think the ask today is, is us basically fulfilling our end of the commitment in the speed sense and that, hey, we're here, we're ready to do the deal and we're committed to this. And so. Um, you know, I, I appreciate your presentation. I appreciate the work you guys are doing. I understand we all want more transparency. Um, I, I believe we're getting as much as we legally can get at this point in time. So I thank you for your candidness. Excellent. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. I believe next we're ready for university projects. And we'll start with Ball State University. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. Um, we would like to uh, ask for approval for our North Campus uh, building renovation project. It's an $81.6 million project that was approved in the last biennial budget. Uh, it's over uh, 350,000 square feet of um, renovation space. Uh, in buildings that include our University Theater, the Hargraves Music Building, Arts and Communications Building, Architecture, uh, and the Architecture Building. These are a package of buildings that were built beginning in the uh, 1950s through the early 70s with a renovation on one of them, um, or a, um, excuse me, a, an addition on the Architecture Building in the 80s. So they are aged buildings, and of course, due to the age, the mechanical systems, electrical, plumbing, uh, and life safety so 
uh, life safety systems of those buildings are really in need of some replacement. They're outdated, inefficient, and certainly in danger of failure. Um, also, uh, on the architecture building, some of you had an opportunity to uh, visit our campus uh, prior to the, the budget session, and you saw the architecture building, those solar panels uh, are leaky. We've tried to fix them a number of times, but um, uh, you know, for the state's only undergraduate, uh, state-funded undergraduate program of architecture, we certainly don't want a leaky building. So, um, so we are requesting uh, the funds for those sorts of things. In addition to some of those mechanical and behind the uh, scenes sorts of things, they'll certainly help to modernize the classroom space, make it more um, useful in a variety of settings. There are some accreditation issues uh, at hand as well, and so I think it will be helpful with those growing programs uh, to make sure that we're obviously keeping those accreditations uh, as we think about the architecture program in the last six years that has increased about 30 percent um, which is uh, certainly something that we want to accommodate so there will be a slight increase in the square footage but um, for the most part this is the the former footprint when we think about those uh, arts and theaters programs uh, we will be coming to you uh, over the next year with approval for uh, a variety of projects related to our village redevelopment, our university adjacent area. What's important about that is, you know, it's a hundred million dollar investment uh, in our community. We haven't seen something like that in quite some time. And the linchpin that the investor, uh, the private investor thought would make this successful really is the strength of those arts and music and theater programs. Uh, it really is a place making peace. Uh, for our community. So uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions, but um, looking forward to moving ahead with this project. Any questions? Yes, Senator Garten. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm assuming, has this project been reviewed by CHE? Yes. And when did that happen? Uh, so it happened during their uh, last meeting um, in July. Okay, so are you aware of sort of the long-standing precedent that there's supposed to be a 30-day window between the CHE review and then becoming before this committee? So there has been um, uh, in recent years some of that, but we did ask the chairman for, uh, because of that uh, inflationary piece, uh, perhaps to, since it has been reviewed a, a couple of times, both in the budget process before and, um, and now, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to see if we could expedite the, just a bit. Sure. And, and Mr. Chair, if I may, yes, just, just, I just want to express a little bit of concern here. You know, my understanding from the context of this committee in particular that there's that 30-day window. I understand it kind of goes through both chambers when we do the budget process, but at that time, we're just talking about the, the basic generalization of the project. My understanding is that 30-day precedent has been set so us as the budget committee can review the details and sort of the minutia of that. And so my only concern here is if we're circumventing sort of a long-standing precedent for Ball State, um, and I think we're probably going to do it again here on the next presentation, um, what what kind of precedent are we saying? What are we breaking for the future, and who else is are going to make those asks? So I just want to express that concern, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You want? I I can respond. <clears throat> I first became aware of both these projects uh, eight months ago, and as Senator Garton mentioned, it has been through both committees and during session, and no concerns ever expressed to me. And so, yes, it does make it more difficult if you're sitting where I'm sitting, because there'll be times you have to make a judgment call, has it been long enough? In my view, being we've just been through session, and it's been three weeks, and there's been zero concerns brought to me, this is okay to go ahead with, in place of waiting for six more weeks, and so, I think as a general rule, 30 days is probably wise in some case, maybe longer. But in my view, being it was just passed in the budget and we've known about this, it's okay to move ahead at this point, in my opinion. But I do respect your thoughts too, thank you. Other comments? Thank you. Next we have um, Vincennes University. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Tony Hahn with Vincennes University. I have one project for your consideration today. The Center for Health Science and Active Learning, a 70,000 square foot facility on the Vincennes campus. This should be a familiar 
project as it was the project funded in the most recent budget and what we presented during the budget process. This $33.9 million cash funded facility will be the new home of our health science program and centrally located on the Vincennes campus and will contain five active learning classrooms as well. This will replace a 37,000 square foot facility that was built in 1970 <coughs> that had space challenges with clinical and lab simulations. This will create a dynamic learning environment with state-of-the-art sim labs, sterile compounding areas, a pharmacy tech lab, physical therapy lab, high fidelity mannequins that are a little creepy if you look at them, full hospital beds and replica rooms, a scrub room to practice in and out of surgical tech. We're all aware of the needs of, and shortages of healthcare workers and nurses in this state, and I'm happy to announce that 95% of our nursing grads who apply for licensure do so in Indiana. So they are staying here and serving Hoosiers. But health science also means other majors as well. Nursing, PT assistants, health info management, radiology, surg surgical tech, pharmacy tech, healthcare administration, and funeral services. This building will also include five active learning classrooms modeled after the Wilmoth building on the West Lafayette campus of Purdue. It's centrally located on campus and those classrooms will be flexible student focused learning classrooms using high technology that will be open to any college. We hope to bid this project in the fall of 23 and open it in the summer of 25. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Thank you. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Senator Curtin. Tony, thanks. Just going back to my question with Ball State, if, if you're not going to bid this to the fall, why do we need to circumvent the precedent for you to hear today? It, and, and I'll say two reasons. I, I did ask to have it on this agenda, selfishly, because I, I want to get going. Sure. Uh, uh, to echo the chairman's comments, we have presented this, and, and you're, you're exactly right. During the budget session, you're looking at holistically, does this building fit your mission? Do you need this? And these 30 days are a chance to dive into the detail. I, I can't disagree with that. I've been on the outside of that, of getting pushed a couple sure. meetings before. Uh, we're on day 22 since the commission meeting. We have heard this before. Um, the next meeting, my understanding, could be, uh, what, October? Six weeks. Six weeks. So September, then we're getting into once we get that approval, and then it does require the governor's signature on the minutes of the next one for it to be officially complete for us to enter into contracts, because there is technically one more step after this. So that pushes us into kind of an unknown territory of late fall. And with all the construction that's happening, we really want to get these bids out early and get our generals locked down for spring action. Sure. So what I heard you say is you're compensating for the governor's inefficiency. Is that what you just said, Tony? It's the process. No, I'm <laughs> no, just, um, so no, I, I appreciate that. And I want to be I want to be clear to this this committee and, and to you, Tony, and to folks that may be listening online. I have less pause about the project so much as the precedent. And I think the precedent's important to maintain um, because I think there's going to come a time where we probably do get challenged as a committee on somebody that wants to circumvent. We need that full 30 or even what you alluded to, maybe even a little more time, Mr. Chair. So, um, you know, I appreciate your leadership in that space. And like I said, I just think the precedent's important. So, thanks for your answers, Tony. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. I believe next we're ready to move to federal economic stimulus items, and we have the Indiana Department of Agriculture. Good morning, everyone, uh, chairman and members of the committee. My name is Katie Nelson, and I'm the deputy director at the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. I have with me David Coates, who is our economic development director, uh, and he knows the weeds of both of these programs that I'm going to present to you. Um, the Indiana State Department of Agriculture requests to approve uh, your approval to receive $8,082,536 in federal funding for the Resilient Food Systems Infrastructure Grant Program, RFSI which is funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture through the American Rescue Plan. 
The grant will enable Indiana to build resilience in the middle of the food chain by strengthening local and regional food systems through new revenue streams for producers through capacity increases in aggregation, distribution, processing of agriculture products, and by modern modernizing and expanding facilities. Possible projects here in Indiana include co-packing facility upgrades, a high-tech mobile food distribution hub, and a mobile flour mill specializing in gluten-free and specialty crop flour with a cold, distri cold storage distribution facility. Applicants uh, will be required to either provide a 25% or 50% match or an in-kind match, and awards will range from $100,000 to $3 million over a three-year grant period. If approved, we hope to begin accepting applications this winter with grants being awarded in May of 2024 and running through May of 2027. The grant does not require ISDA to provide state matching funds to administer the program, and any additional admin costs will be covered by the federal funding received. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions? Continue, please. Thank you. Um, the next program um, is the meat, process, meat and Poultry Processing Intermediary Lending Program. It's alphabet soup over here in agriculture. Um, the Indiana State Department of Agriculture requests approval to receive $15 million in federal funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture for an intermediary lending program to address critical meat expansion needs that developed during the COVID-19 pandemic and have continued since. ISDA is partnering with the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, IEDC, to administer the program, which is intended specifically for small Indiana meat and poultry processors, and small is defined by 500 employees or less. The MPILP expansion program will run through the Indiana Small Business Development Centers, SBDCs, which would support ISDA and IEDC working directly with the meat processing establishments. The program will provide low interest, 3% scalable loans ranging from $100,000 for specialty meat processing equipment to multi-million dollar facility expansion projects. The selection process for projects will include an independent review board with concurrence through the USDA. The MPILP program will continue beyond the initial three-year grant performance period in perpetuity through conservative management of the loan funds and the principal and interest received from the revolving loan program. As such, it is to be self-supporting through the grant and accumulated interest. When surveyed in December of 2022, we found $51 million in meat expansion needs identified across Indiana. These investments will add job opportunities and tax revenues for local communities and the state. Our partnership with IEDC will be integral for the success of this program, and we appreciate their assistance thus far. Another partnership we're excited about is that with the Indiana Bankers Association. We actually met with them yesterday, uh, again yesterday, to gather input, answer questions, and discuss ways for them to be involved in this program. Any questions? Yes, Senator Garten. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for your presentation, and, and I was glad to hear that last portion that you met with the Bankers yes. Association, because the only concern I would have is that we're not taking government agencies and competing with private market yes and that was their concern too and so we yeah. had a long discussion about that yesterday and how we can partner with them uh, one of the things that we can do is priority score for applicants um, who are coming along with their local bank for this program we don't see it as an either or we sure. see it as a both and yeah i appreciate them just yeah. continue to encourage you to play in that space so thank you thank you thank you further questions thank you thanks i believe next on the agenda, we're ready for review items, Family and Social Services Administration. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Paul Bowling, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Family and Social Service Administration. So we have three Medicaid state plan amendments for you today. The first state plan amendment today is regarding our recovery audit contracting services. This amendment would seek an exemption from CMS on the requirement that recovery audit services are contracted with a third party. These are services that, that we have provided internally since 2018 and we are required to file this exemption with CMS every two years. There is no fiscal impact to this state plan amendment. Any questions? Thank you. Can you continue, please. Our second state plan amendment is clarifying language around palliative care services and being covered under home health services. These are services that are covered today, but there have, we have been requested to put additional clarifying language in our state plan concerning the type of agencies that are able to provide these services. Based on this, the state plan amendment would add palliative care services to the list of services in our state plan for home health services. 
There is no fiscal impact based on we already cover these services today, so there is really no change in cost. Questions? Thank you. Continue, please. All right. The last state plan amendment today relates to several changes to nursing facility reimbursement methodology. Um, there are several pieces to this, so I, I will step through them one at a time. The first change is a change the methodology in which we reimburse for specialty care units and ventilator dependent residency care units. Um, currently, um, a facility wide method is used for a specific add on. Currently, in a facility, if you have nine individuals that are on a ventilator, there's an add on payment added to for a facility for each Medicaid patient day that you are reimbursed for. This state plan, under the new methodology, a provider would get an $80 per day for any specific patient on a ventilator to cover the additional cost of staffing and equipment cost. Th this change would be effective July 1st of 2023. Thank you. Any, any questions? Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just a quick question. Has uh, H Health and Human Services or CMS been in contact with FSSA or the state in regards to the Medicaid unwind that we're doing? Um, yes, I mean, we've been in contact with CMS through that process, um, Representative Porter. Um, so we're in contact with them as we work through that process um, from that aspect of things. Okay, because uh, we have 53, 53,000, and now I guess it went down to 23,000, something like that. So, uh, so, so we are adopt adapting, and they do understand the movement that we're having, correct? Um, yes, and you're talking about the number of, of individuals that are um, being covered yeah. under, under Medicaid? Yes, sir. Yes, and, and we're required to do reporting on what our PHE unwind looks like and um, the movement that we're seeing in our populations, and that's something that we're continuing to monitor as we go through that process. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? Continue, please. All right. All right, third change is related to the nursing facility supplemental program that is moving from the quality payment, which is moving our quality payment from the current Medicaid per diem under to a UPL payment program. This new supplemental payment formula calls for a 10% quality component that will ramp up to 20% over a five year period. Um, this overall, as we ramp into this period, just to be clear, um, there will be a three ramp three year ramp up period. So for the first three years of this change, there will be uh, a combination of the old method and the new method. So we won't actually be at 10% um, starting year one. So that'll take some time to get up to 10%. And then at the end of the five years, we'll be up to 20%. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for your presentation. All right. I, there was one more piece. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Go ahead then. I, I, all right, Excuse me. so the fourth and final piece of this nursing facility is moving the U UPL supplemental program from a provider specific payment to a pooled methodology. So currently a facility's UPL payment is based on the difference between the Medicaid reimbursement they receive and the Medicare reimbursement. This is moving to a more uniform approach, which will provide an add on to a facility based on a uniform percentage increase to the base rate. This change will be effective July 1 of 2024. Questions? Senator Garton? Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that. Just a quick question in terms, if I'm a provider, to me that change is pretty drastic. And so help me understand, articulate for me structurally what's gonna change for me as a provider when we go to that pool model. Um, so, so under the pool model, when we look at it, what it's gonna do in total is it's gonna look at the total reimbursement for all the facilities based on Medicaid and Medicare, right? They're gonna look at that difference. And then it's going to be, we're going to um, proportion that, then we're gonna look at that, and we're gonna look at what your specific Medicaid rate, and that's gonna be distributed proportionally based on what your current Medicaid rate is. So as a provider, you're gonna look at where your current Medicaid rate is and where that falls into kind of the other facilities you have, and that'll affect the payment that you're receiving. So I also heard you say that there was going to be an increase to the base of that as well. So where does that come into play as a provider in terms of proportionality and how that's redistributed to me as a provider? 
Well, in, in what I was referencing is what it'll do is this will determine what that percentage is and then there'll be an add-on to your base per diem rate. So really, if you're getting, you could be getting $200 today, look at a UPL payment, and then you would get an add-on to that $200 a day based on this new methodology. So, and I'm gonna overgeneralize this and feel free to correct me. So if I'm a provider, is it safe to say that I will see an increase for Medicaid services or not? An increase in Medicaid services? What I'm reimbursed for those services. Um, it, it is definitely going to d depend on where you fall in that UPL and what percentage add-on you, you are receiving from that standpoint. The difference is that's an add-on right now. You're getting a supplemental payment, you know, right now quarterly um, through the <coughs> UPL payment. This will be under an add-on payment to um, your, your base. So there is a chance, though, that some of our providers here in Indiana could see a decrease in the services they're providing in terms of reimbursement. If yeah, we go to this depending pool on that quality pool and where they fall, you know, where they fall into that quality pool, because now there will be a separate pool for quality. Um, and depending on where a facility falls in that quality pool would determine, you know, how much of that funding they receive. And I, you know, I feel like it's important to note, Mr. Chair, I know we've got a, a Medicaid oversight task force, I believe, that stood up. Um, and so I don't want to I don't want to go too deep on the Medicaid side of this, but the one thing I do want to point out is, you know, we've had some conversations in the General Assembly regarding folks that serve as Hoosiers in this Medicaid space, and there seems to be less and less of that. And so now by going to this pool model, what I'm hearing is those dollars could potentially go down for those providing services even more. Not suggesting we need to continue to grow Medicaid, that's not what I'm saying, but has there been... I just think there's some concern that we need to strike a balance and try to figure out with folks that are providing these services are they going to continue to be able to do that with the amount of reimbursement they're receiving under the pool model? Yeah, and I will clarify that when we look at the reimbursement and funding overall reimbursement going to nursing facilities, it'll remain to in total the same. Sure. So what's going out to all nursing facilities will remain the same. Sure. It may vary between, like you're saying, between particular facilities, but we're not re reducing the amount of funding going out to these facilities. I understand. Has there been any modeling done? Do you sense a... I mean, could this force any current facilities in Indiana to close? I, I'm modeling? not aware of that modeling. I know they have looked at this and they've extensively <clears throat> worked with the nursing facilities and hospital associations um, in, in various work groups that they've been working through. But I have not seen modeling. I'm not saying, you know, if, if there is or not. Do you know if we're providers part of that conversation? Um, yes. I mean, there has been a large extensive group of people that have met I don't know the number of times, but it's been a lot of times to discuss this. Um, so, yeah, providers were part of those conversations. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Right. Next on the agenda, I believe we have fees, fines, and penalties. And this is new for this committee. It's regarding uh, House Bill 1627. 23. Okay. I have too many numbers there. Uh, I believe um, Director Jackson has some comments with regard to this before we start. Yeah, I, I just asked the chairman if I could just make a couple of remarks as we as we move into this part of the agenda. Um, with the passage of 1623 this past session, we now have a new type of recurring agenda item that we're going to be seeing to come before this committee and, and probably um, several times over the foreseeable future. We, we have two agencies today. Um, <laughs> kind of he heading this off for the first time, and, and that is uh, DHS first, followed by the Department of Insurance. But, but just as a reminder, 1623 set several requirements that an agency must consider when establishing or changing fees, fines, or um, civil pen penalties via rule. Um, and in addition, 1623 requires agencies to come before the Budget Committee um, to get reviewed, those, those things reviewed before they can proceed with a regular interim or provisional rule that adds, any adds or increases any type of fee, fine, or civil penalty. So again, that's why they're here today, and um, you know, I, I guess kind of get used to it. We're, we're going to see a lot of these coming in the near future. Okay. Th thank you. Yep. Go ahead then, uh, Department of Homeland Security. So yes. So uh, good morning again. Joel Thacker, Executive Director, IDHS. I have with me Justin Goodell, our General Counsel, Devin Burks, our CFO, here to discuss a uh, $50 
application fee. Uh, this fee already exists in uh, one aspect. So as fire instructors recertify um, every couple of years, they do that automatically. They submit a button and they're good to go. If they um, recertify later than, than their date, then we have to manually work with them to uh, work through the recertification process. And we charge a $50 fee for that recertification process. So now, uh, nationally, the national standard for fire investigators is that they need to be renewing that certification every two years. And so we would be looking to expand uh, that $50 fee to fire investigators that fail to recertify in a timely period. And additionally, uh, something that we experience, um, oh, 100, one or 200 times a year is reciprocity. So maybe firefighters coming in from other states that bring in other certifications and they try to align with Indiana certifications. That's a manual process that we work with them individually to ensure that they align. And we're asking for um, an application fee to, to work with these individuals to ensure that their certification and their training aligns with Indiana in order to provide them an Indiana certification. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Senator Garten. Thank you. Um, again, thank you. Just, just a quick sort of generalization. What does it cost the agency to administer that program, that recertification? So, um, processing, you know, it, it again, uh, automatically, it's, we're, we're kicking it out. Um, you know, it, it may take um, a few hours. We have annually um, 7,000 fire instructors in Indiana uh, and about 3,000 fire investigators. So as they renew, then that populates up online automatically. But when we have to work with these individuals that, that fail on time, we have to go through and make sure that they have all of their required training in line. And it, it takes a few hours per individual, and so we're just trying to recoup sure. a little bit of cost for that. So do we know what it costs to administer the program? The actual, um, you know, I'll have to, I'll have to double check sure. that for you. Thank you. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing. If, what you're asking for may be completely sufficient. What we might find is it's not sufficient. Uh, but I think that's important context in this conversation regarding fees for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Next, I believe we have Department of Insurance. So good morning, members of the committee. My name is Amy Beard. I'm the commissioner of the Indiana Department of Insurance. And with me today, I have my general counsel, Megan Brumball. We are here today to present for the committee's review of the civil penalty provision we intend to include in the interim rule for the all payer claims database. The APCD is a large scale database that collects and aggregates significant amounts of healthcare data. Indiana Code Section 27-1-44.5-11D allows the department to impose a civil penalty on a health payer that is required to submit information to the APCD and fails to comply. Health payer is defined by statute and examples include health insurers, pharmacy benefit managers, multiple employer welfare arrangements, and employee benefit plans subject to ERISA. The proposed penalty is $100 per day per violation for the first 30 days that the health payer fails to provide the required data to the APCD, and $1,000 for each day thereafter. Civil penalties collected must be deposited in and used in accordance with the Department of Insurance Fund created by Indiana Code 27-1-3-28. So the civil penalty was first adopted in March of 2023 when the APCD rule was first promulgated and is in effect now. The amount is in alignment with other penalties assessed by the department as well as other APCDs in other states. 
The civil penalty ensures appropriate accountability for reporting to the APCD. It is important to ensure that the APCD collects as much data as possible to achieve its legislative purposes, such as identifying healthcare needs and informing policy, as outlined in Indiana Code 27-1-44.5-4B. The department's currently working closely with health payers to ensure their knowledge of the submission requirements and procedures as part of the implementation of this new program and is optimistic that compliance with these requirements will be high. For this reason, the department believes the penalties set forth in the interim rule are unlikely to generate significant revenue. And we're happy to answer any questions about the proposed civil penalty. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Yes, Senator Carton. Thank you. Um, so I'll kind of start with the same question I asked our last presenter. I know you said it wouldn't generate significant revenue. Help me understand what that means. What's it cost for you to administer that, this program in particular? So to administer this program in our budget, we've budgeted $5.5 million okay. going forward. Um, but we do not think that these fees are going to generate a lot of money for us right now because we would like to think that all the submitters are going to be submitting data. So we actually hope we don't receive any sure. revenue under this provision. Sure, good. And then if I'm a provider, help me understand structurally the process of how it works. How, how are you gonna notify me that I'm late on submitting the required submittal? Or, or are you gonna notify me? So what we did is we issued a request for production for an administrator to help us with some of the messaging. And so we have um, procured a contract with On Point Health Data. They have about half of the APCDs in other states, <coughs> about less than fewer than half of the states have an APCD. And so they're able to replicate the messaging that they've done in other states and message the communications plan that they had to be able to implement that in Indiana. So what we've done is we've had like insurer only training or provider only training. We've worked with the hospital association, some of the um, provider trades to make sure that we are messaging that this database requirement is coming. And so the payers of health claims are gonna be the ones required to submit to the APCD. We don't necessarily think that providers will be submitting directly and we'll only be getting the claims data through insurers or PBMs or even MIWAs, which are the multiple employer uh, welfare agreements. Okay. And then, and again, if so, if I'm, if I'm a provider, is there a cap on the amount of fees I can accrue or do I just rack those up indefinitely? So we are actually um, expecting more of the insurers to, to report. I don't think we have any penalty provisions necessarily for providers right now and haven't looked um, to assess a civil penalty against providers at this time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. I believe next we have on the agenda Indiana Department of Education with regard to literacy. Good morning. My name is Carrie M. Polk Meek, and I am the director of the Literacy Center at the Indiana Department of Education. Proud ma educator. Ma'am, would you go up to the microphone, please? Thank oh my gosh, you went to the wrong. Well, that's a great way to start. <laughs> Here's the good news I've been an educator for 25 years. I made a fool of myself in front of thousands of kids, <laughs> no, so no, we're, we're solid. All right. <laughs> microphone, here I am. All right. Indiana Department of Ed. Um, I'm Carrie Ann Polk Meek. I'm the director of the Literacy Center. Started the Department of Ed a couple of years ago. As I mentioned, um, I've been an administrator and a teacher for over 25 years. So I'm here to discuss with you today the Lilly Endowment Literacy Grant Match, which was um, awarded during the last legislative session. And I thought I would start by just highlighting a little bit of why we are here today and the work with the endowment and then just discuss um, next steps um, that we're asking for for um, the money over the next um, academic year. As you may know, and I'm sure you do, Indiana's literacy rates have been dropping for a decade, well before COVID. Um, we saw a peak um, of 91% in 2012, 2013. Um, our last reported scores um, in 21-22 following the pandemic were at 81.6%. Just wanna mention that that iRead 3 test is a basic foundational test of reading skills. 
We know, based on um, the amount of data that we have collected um, during this administration, that by third grade, um, we have kiddos that pass, they're 35% more likely to graduate um, from high school. We also know, based on our data, that currently one in five Indiana third grade students is not proficient in key, and I'm saying foundational, literacy skills based on the administration of that exam. Nationally, um, on NAEP, we are seeing that 33% of Indiana fourth graders scored at or above proficiency, which of course means that the majority of our fourth graders are not uh, measuring as proficient on that national report card on reading, if you will. We also are very aware that the achievement gap continues to persist for our most at-risk students. Um, and when we disaggregate that data, we have not seen an improvement um, over the testing administration for that group of kiddos. In August of 2022, Indiana Department of Education, along with the governor's office, announced, and, and when I say historic, I was actually a social studies teacher, um, so I have some grounding in that, a historic investment in literacy in the state of Indiana from um, the Lilly Endowment, which was equal to um, $60 million. At that point, um, the Department of Education had already um, allotted uh, $26 million in ESSER II funds and had created what is now known as the Indiana Literacy Cadre. And I'll speak uh, to that a little bit in a moment. Um, the Lilly Endowment had also done something that um, has not um, been seen in other states, and that is that they had provided a $25 million um, investment to teacher prep that would allow for teacher prep pro uh, programs even prior to the legislative session to plan a course to align their um, curriculum to the science of reading for their early uh, literacy teachers. We also, during the last legislative session, had an additional 60 million, um, increasing the overall investment in early literacy in the state of Indiana, aligned to the science of reading to $170 million. Um, have not seen that in my career as an educator, um, and been doing it for a minute as I mentioned. So I do wanna just tell you what the Lilly um, Endowment grants have been doing for schools through the Indiana Literacy um, Cadres so that um, you can understand how this $10 million will augment those programs. Uh, first, we set out to deploy instructional coaches to elementary schools. Initially, those were opt-in, so those were schools that wanted to join. And again, that was instructional coaches dedicated to the K-3 space aligning curriculum and development to the science of reading. We offered um, and are offering stipends up to $1,200 to teachers um, in early literacy, the K through, K through three, who participate in professional development focused on the science of reading. Continue to provide targeted support for students who need the most help in improving their reading, and then created the Literacy Center at the Indiana Department of Ed. This $10 million, um, the goal is to create a new grant opportunity specifically for schools that did not join cohorts one or cohort two of the Indiana Literacy Cadre. So we are kicking off officially our second year of the, um, the cadre. And we want um, to allow them to align their corporation schools to the science of reading this school year. That would include, as was mentioned in the memo that was submitted prior to the meeting, that successful applicants incorporate at least one of the following. So um, as I mentioned before, a full-time literacy instructional coach that will help schools serving K through three, provide release time, direct support for teachers and principals who are pursuing professional development to align instruction uh, to the science of reading, and increase instructional time for students who have been identified as struggling readers in K three and to purchase curricular core or supplemental materials that are aligned to the science of reading. What questions do you have for me other than why did I stand in the wrong spot to start this presentation? Any questions? Commissioner Delaney? Yeah, I, I think this focus on science of reading is critical and yeah. uh, like a lot of people, I was uh, dubious until I started digging in uh, I'm having trouble with why these are, quote, options and why they're what amounts to grants. Mm -hmm. why, why is this not mandatory that every teacher, uh, given our, the legislation we just passed, why isn't it mandatory that all teachers be trained to do science of reading, mm -hmm. which I, I take to be really mean phonics, that they're trained to do it mm -hmm. and they do it. So yeah. w w what's this 
grant idea here. I appreciate um, you pushing me to clarify. So we are doing, as you mentioned in the legislative session, right. there are standards have been realigned um, to match the, the science of reading in um, our early literacy spaces. You will have seen legislation where curriculum will, we're in the process of curriculum review, so schools must um, adopt curriculum starting next year during their next curriculum cycle that is aligned to the science of reading. Um, so the grant itself, um, and then 1590, I'll follow up with that, does say that schools that fall below 70% on iRead will have to um, either join the cadre or they're going to have to align themselves explicitly. So you are absolutely correct that we have legislation in place that will ensure that um, schools are aligning themselves to the science of reading. This grant opportunity is a way for schools to submit an application, if you will, that shows us how they're aligning this year, this academic year, to the science of reading. These may be, or these will be, um, with approval, schools that have not joined the Indiana Literacy Cadre, but allows them to have a one-year leg up with some oversight from the department in regarding the curriculum and um, the professional development and the instructional coaches that they're using um, so that they have a leg up in making sure that their alignment is ready to go. So, so <laughs> to use, I guess, a securities term, yeah. they, they can front run, meaning they can choose to jump into this program earlier and you'll give them a grant is that right absolutely and the grant process um, you know it, it will be extensive the review will be um, very thoughtfully aligned to the initiatives that the department has already approved the curricular processes um, the standards that we've set through the Indiana literacy College. should this then go away once the full weight of the statutes in place where they have no choice but to do science of reading yeah Okay. Yeah, and it, it, the, the key then is how, um, how we're very diligent in our support of them. The Lilly um, endorsement, the Lilly grant, actually um, is employed through 2026. So we will have um, cadre schools, three cadre schools in total by 2026. Um, I mean, there's, I could talk for okay. a while. I, I, I know, I but I, I just. I mean, we've got the reading endorsement, which is also underway, which will allow for veteran teachers to be um, 80 hours, 40 live, um, you know, 40 um, potentially online. So we're also behind this having teachers that will be highly trained veteran teachers with a reading endorsement. We have legislation that also says that um, after July of 2025, all teachers entering this space will have that endorsement before they're licensed. So absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank you because I think you're supporting what we tried to do. And uh, we don't have any years to give up on these kids. No, no Especially sir. the ones who suffered through the COVID yep. disaster. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Delaney, I got a comment. Thank you. Great questions. And we're on the same page on this one. All of us around this table, uh, members of the committee and staff, we didn't leave high school or college ever thinking someday we'd be here. We had yeah. to learn a whole lot, a whole lot. More to learn in my case, for sure. But it's foundational to be able to read, isn't it? To be able to learn to, to someday sit in, in these chairs, whether members or staff. And so thank you. And I encourage you to continue pushing forward. It, it yeah. is key for our state. Yeah, we certainly appreciate the support. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next we have on the agenda, Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, the IEDC appreciates your view of the IEDC's policy for Ready 2.0, the second phase of a one-of-a-kind investment program focused on supporting regional quality of place investments with the aim of accelerating the state's population growth to support economic growth and development across the state. The first round of the program has been a tremendous success. To date, the IEDC and our regional partners have identified approximately 360 projects requesting $470.1 million in ready funding that are now underway or will commence within the next year. These projects have addressed housing, infrastructure, workforce training, and child care needs across the state, as well as helping meet the demand for growing public park space and trail networks and investing in public art and communities around Indiana. The state's investment in these projects is expected to generate a total of $14 billion in quality of place investment within the next few years. 
a nearly 24 to 1 leverage ratio, far exceeding the IDC's goal of $4 invested alongside each ready dollar committed to the implementation of regional development plans. To maintain the momentum and support cr critical investments being considered by the state and our regional and local partners, the General Assembly graciously appropriated an additional $500 million in funding for Ready 2.0. In accordance with the statutory framework included in this year's budget, the IEDC has developed a policy that will guide participating regions as they build and update their regional development plans first put together in 2021 for the first round of the program. It will also outline the IEDC's expectations for what must be included in the application for funding submitted to the IEDC and provide guidance to regions on how the IEDC and our Strategic Review Committee will assess and evaluate those submissions for funding under this initiative. With this policy, the IEDC will provide a standardized application framework for regions to allow us to have a common structure to ensure the IEDC is able to assess each region's proposal with a uniform baseline to work from. Additionally, the IEDC has proposed to establish a more robust performance metrics for the program, maintaining expectations from the first round of investments, including program match, private investment goals, and the focus on population growth. For this phase of READY, the IEDC is also seeking to achieve specific goals around population growth, income, um, and meeting the state's housing needs, and continuing to address childcare challenges in Indiana's vibrant and growing communities. While the program will maintain a similar structure and is expected to function very similar to the first phase of the program, the IEDC is exploring opportunities to deepen our partnership with our regional partners to ensure alignment in investment priorities, to coordinate ready investments with other projects in their region to enhance this program's impact, and to streamline the administrative obligations on the regional organizations leading the effort for their communities to maximize the amount of funding that is ultimately contributed directly to projects. We're grateful for the support of the legislature and the state's focus on quality of place um, in support of our other economic development responsibilities. Um, as you all know, the availability of a high-skilled workforce is, is a critical component in a business's location decision and investing in Indiana cities, towns, and counties. In fact, we're increasingly fielding questions during our interaction with current and prospective businesses about what the community and the state are doing to create vibrant places that will help them attract and retain the workforce that they need to grow. Because of Ready, the state has risen above our competitors and realized historic commitments from companies that are driving economic growth and prosperity throughout Indiana. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we're excited to partner once again with the state's regional communities to invest in capital projects and infrastructure improvements that will lead to population and economic growth over the next few years. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, sir. Senator Cadora. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate the presentation. I reviewed the policy. I remember when we discussed the Ready 2.0 during the budget, housing was added as an eligible use. But when I look at the framework, the policy framework, <laughs> towards the end of the first page, it said that the IEDC does not expect regions to develop completely new applications for the phase of the, for this phase of the READY program. Rather, the expectation is for regions to use the initial application submitted in 2021. Some of these applications, and in 2021, might not have focused on housing. Mm -hmm. So I just want to understand, does that, is the framework of this policy is going to be heavily reliant on previously submitted proposal despite new challenges that these regions may have? Or will it consider some of these emerging housing issues or? That's a great question, Senator. And um, you know, when you know, looking at the opportunity for a second round of funding for this program, knowing that uh, our regional partners had invested a significant amount of time, money, resources um, in developing a plan to begin with, um, our expectation is that they would, again, use that and then update it based off of uh, their progress in implementing the first part of the plan, um, as well as if there are other identified projects or challenges that, um, if addressed, can help them retain and grow the, the population and, and um, you know, incomes and educational attainment within their region. So we are trying to be flexible, much like uh, the first phase, not being too prescriptive, uh, knowing that a, you know, an issue in one community might be different from uh, that in, a, in another part of the state. I appreciate that. So what I heard is flexibility. There will Correct. be flexibility to accommodate <coughs> eligible new investments as long as they can justify that. Correct. That's correct. Great. My second and final question: um, 
any thoughts about the recent reports that we have, even though IEDC is heavily investing in attracting new businesses and jobs to our state, I've read a recent report that showed that we're uh, losing manufacturing jobs compared to the nation. Um, and uh, the main correlation in that report said that the issue in Indiana is that we are losing the, the competition to um, produce enough um, advanced manufacturing workforce. How, how is that <clears throat> being incorporated in, in IEDC's thoughts with Ready 2.0 to overcome this strategic challenge mm -hmm. of attracting businesses, incentivizing businesses to come to our state at a time when the pipeline of workforce um, is being challenged because we have uh, declining enrollment in post high school or secondary education. How does the Ready 2.0 contemplate to address that challenge? Another great question, Senator. And um, you know, it, it is you know an issue that we are continuing to keep a very close eye on. Um, you know, the answer and, and reason for that decline is, you know, somewhat nuanced, um, both in terms of, you know, just net job growth, um, but also the classification of some of these uh, jobs. Um, as companies are um, investing in new types of technologies and manufacturing processes, um, you know, it's not just manufacturing is the classification of, as the, of the job anymore. Um, it's getting, uh, again, a, bit, a little bit more nuanced, but um, again, it is something that we are paying attention to and, and why we want to work very closely with um, your regional partners. Um, if there are significant <coughs> manufacturing investments that are contemplated or, or moving forward within the region uh, to ensure that, you know, if there is an opportunity to contribute some of these dollars to help ensure the success of those investments. Um, you know, one example is, um, you know, partnership with Ivy Tech in a number of different locations around the state in close proximity to other IEDC economic development investments uh, to revitalize uh, vacant and deteriorating assets, but to do it in a way that also provides um, area residents today and into the future um, the opportunities to get the skills that they need to fill those positions. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'll conclude by saying I think there's an opportunity for synergies it, this committee, uh, this meeting and last meeting, we reviewed multiple multi-billion dollar investments that are coming to the state. And if we are unable to keep up with the workforce and the workforce housing, uh, it will challenge do, you know, your ability to attract more uh, business. So investing in our communities and our neighborhoods is critical. So I appreciate IEDC truly and critically um, contemplating these strategic challenges as you roll out the Ready 2.0. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Carton. Uh, if I could, thank you. Of course, you. can. Um, Senator Kador, good questions. I, I may just, just remind you, as sure. some of the members on this committee, we also passed a bill that allocated $50 million for municipalities to help provide infrastructure to bring the cost of development down in some, of these, some, yeah. some of these communities. Yeah. Um, so we are doing some work in that space. Um, I think we can always make a case yeah. of how much more can we do, and I think that's a fair point. Um, Mr. Waski, specifically to, to Ready 2.0. So as, as I, you know, as I, I go around and, and talk to our, our RDA appointments in these different, um, you know, these different locals, and you know, I see one here today. Mr. Kevin Kelms is Jefferson County's uh, one Southern Indiana RDA appointment, and appreciate the work that they did. And they were kind of the golden child, I think, across the state on how they allocated and got monies out. But as I go around and had some of those meetings and listened to some of the feedback from the original Ready program. Mm -hmm. Some of the feedback I got was that actually getting those dollars to the end user was a little clunky. Mm -hmm. And we've had some meetings. My understanding is some of that was due to the fact that those were uh, ARPA dollars. Mm -hmm. That first ready program was all strictly based on federal monies. And it's important to note, um, which leads me to my question, these are all, this is $500 million of general fund state money. Correct. So these are Hoosier tax dollars, mm -hmm. right? And so, so what's going to change as far as not just allocating the dollars, but writing the check and getting the dollars to the end user to fund these projects? And Senator, I, I think you made a fantastic point there. And um, you know, we had uh, brought on some additional um, assistance. It was the first time really that the IEDC sure. had dealt with federal resources um, in a significant form before um, and wanting to make sure that we remained um, in utmost compliance with the federal requirements, which, um, you know, based off the feedback that we received was, you know, even more complicated than typical federal programs. Sure. Uh, so it, it was clunky. In part, um, I think there was some confusion at the outset 
around what the money could actually be used for. Um, you know, within the regulations, it had a prescriptive list of projects that were eligible for this funding. Um, and there was some confusion about <coughs> whether it had to be water, wastewater, or broadband infrastructure, um, or if there were uh, more flexible options for us. Um, thanks to our partnership with the State Budget Agency um, and their support, OMB, uh, we were able to maximize the flexibility for the IEDC um, and made us eligible for essentially any project that the region wanted to pursue. We were able to use our dollars, even though they may have, the lo local community may have had some additional restrictions or limitations that weren't placed on the state. Um, and, and part of that also was some creativity around if it was a, um, say, a, a housing development, uh, multifamily affordable housing development, uh, we had to be very specific in the types of things that we were paying for associated with that. Um, and it did take a little while to be able to, on some of these projects, identify exactly what that is and then work with the regions to get the appropriate paperwork in, again, to make sure that we were remaining in compliance. But our hope is with this now being funded with state dollars, um, you know, we will be able to move a little bit more quickly while still ensuring that um, you know, we are tracking where the dollars go at the end of the day and are able to demonstrate to you that they were used appropriately. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I believe we're at that point in the uh, process here. Are there any motions to remove any items from the proposed agenda? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adopt, formally adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes, you may. I intend to support the agenda for today. But I just want to note it for the record that I, there are two concerns that I will continue to maintain until they are resolved. I think the uh, Westfield jail continues to be an ongoing discussion to me. Um, I appreciate more clarity that we received today. I still believe that $800 million of additional cost on any project should help us pause and rethink um, how we can move forward because $800 million is a lot of money, is a lot of taxpayer dollars. And I appreciate your thoughtfulness of thinking about saving $400 million from closing the state prison. But I think it, we need, I'm fully supportive of DOC. I want, uh, similar to Senator Garten's comments, we need to address this project, but I, I just have heartburn over the $800 million of additional cost. The second thing that I have concerns with that we also discussed um, is the IEDC uh, transparency issues. Uh, I'm not, uh, IEDC uh, operate within what they can legally based on federal and state law, and they, they have to move quickly, and I understand that. But there are a couple of projects that made the headlines recently, including the LEAP Innovation Project um, and the water supply issue that could potentially impact water resources for our communities. There was another article about potentially the, the, uh, the donors to the IEDC Foundation. Um, they were very professional and responsive to my request. I spoke with IEDC. I just hope that we can continue to have conversations about these issues to bring more transparency to the public. My final point, since we started talking about fines and fees, um, um, uh, one recommendation, and I maybe speak with Mr. Jackson after this, uh, taxpayers mainly fund our government operations, so there are opportunities to give them some relief. Uh, we charge for credit card fees across the board. I don't know what the cost would be to eliminate that for all government agencies. Um, you know, taxpayers access services that they already paid for to fund government. I don't know if it's a couple of million dollars a year, but I just urge you to think creatively about giving more relief to taxpayers as they access their own government that they funded with their own money. These are just my thoughts. I intend to support the agenda, but I just want to note on record that I still have a couple of concerns, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Further comments before we vote? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the proposed agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair hears it passing unanimous. With that, I believe we have some reports that have been received, just noting that is listed there on our agenda. Anything else that needs to come or comments for the committee before we adjourn? Hearing none, I do want to say to the public, uh, Indiana is a great place to visit. 
But I do want to note that if you've not been to Madison and Clifty Falls State Park, I want to give them a, a good heads up. It's a great place to visit. Uh, we've been here as a family numerous times. I would recommend that. And so with that, we stand adjourned.